Yes. Now, what we're going to cover is the period after the Second, Second World War to the middle of the 1970s. Uh, so these are, this is an unusual, unusually formative period, uh, significant period really in, in development terms, uh, and then the Second World War. It is remarkable for two, three different reasons. It's remarkable for the high growth that Western Europe, Japan, and America enjoyed in all those years, four to five percent growth in GDP. And in the early period, you can say this was recovery from the Second World War, but, but remain wasn't damaged by the Second World War. Uh, America, in fact, if anything, the the economy benefited from uh, being being se sending things to Europe uh, and you know taking over a lot of the manufacturing markets, global markets that had been neglected because Europe and Japan were all thoroughly engaged in the war. The forty two percent of global GDP at the end of the Second World War. So that this growth for America. You know, being able to sustain four to five percent is rare. It's on top of what America had achieved, you know, before, well, recovering from the Great Depression and then through the Second World War. Uh, and, for, and for Europe, uh, <clears throat> you know, Germany uh, was the most damaged. Germany was extremely heavily bombed. Their ports were destroyed, their infrastructure was there. A lot of their industrial infrastructure was destroyed, airports were destroyed. So Germany uh, naturally had very high growth in the uh, in the initial period, uh, reconstruction simply. But then this growth was sustained, and that was the case really elsewhere in Europe as well. So a period of very high growth, uh, and then Japan, pretty well smashed. Two, two atom bombs on Japan. Tokyo bombed intensely, intensively for for two three months. Uh, and their infrastructure totally destroyed, ports, airports. And then Japan, on top of that, was occupied by the American army for several years after the Second World War. So Japan, again, after it recovered from, uh, like Germany, after it recovered, and of course, in reconstruction, as you can imagine, there will be high growth because you're building back your all your civil infrastructure to start working again. But then when it does start working again, Japan achieves incredibly high rates of growth, you know, uh, maintaining over 10% for a lot, 10% uh, growth in GDP for a long time. So, so, so that's the first point about this period. <clears throat> very, very strong growth, sustained growth throughout the period. The second, day, these are the years of the uh, Cold War. Um, America as the leader of the free world, i.e non-communist world, and the free world was a, a term America chose to use, a, a number of countries uh, in Asia, after the, just after the Second World War, a number of countries in Asia, Africa, uh, were still actually colonies. So it was hardly the free world. It did become the free world. Later, these countries did get their independence. But that's the, that's the term America used in contrast with the, the Cold War rivals, the communist bloc, led by Russia, but in 1948, uh, China uh, had had the communists in China had won the civil war, and China was now a communist country. So if you look at the, um, you really need to see a map of the world to see the colossal area that had become communist. So all of Russia, Russia spans nine time zones. Russia goes from Finland to Japan, and then borders, you know. Iran uh, and and uh, China, so huge land area plus China, gigantic population. So these countries had had internal revolutions, were solidly communist. On top of that, Russia had heavy influence in Eastern Europe, 
uh, in the course of the Second World War in pushing out the German invasion that had gone into Russia. They pushed the Germans back all the way to Germany. In the meantime, they occupied or they marched through the, a number of Eastern European countries, starting from the north, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, you know, Belarus, Poland, um, Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia. Latvia already also, you know, was part of the communist bloc. So, so a huge, huge communist bloc. And so it's also the period of the Cold War. It's the period of um, America fighting communist influence through supporting its allies with military means, with uh, a lot of financial assistance, a lot of assistance from the new institutions that had been created, which we'll talk about after the Second World War, the IMF, the World Bank, GATT, General Agreement for Trade and Tariffs, which is now the WTO. Also, uh, uh, in addition to the World Bank, uh, the Asian Development Bank was created uh, with Japan as the core of it and the Latin American Development Bank in Latin America. So all these big multilateral institutions also came into existence. And these were uh, really uh, some, you know, the, the construction, we will look at them. We, we, we will look at all these institutions in a minute. But America was very much behind the creation of the use them I had a lot of influence over them and used them for supporting its allies. Similarly, the communist countries also created a trading bloc or an institutional bloc called Comic-Con, C-O-M-E-C-O-N. And Comic-Con performed similar roles for, but, but remember the communist world was, uh, the economies were managed quite differently. So, you can't compare Comic-Con with this big uh, set of in international financial institutions, the multilaterals that, that uh, Western Europe, America uh, just talked about. So it's a period of Cold War, but it's a period of the uh, Chinese. In particular, well, they're very concerned with Russian Eastern Europe into Western Europe. At the end of the Second World War, there are very strong communist parties in Italy, uh, in France. In Britain, there isn't a communist party, but there is a Labour Party that's gone quite far left. Um, and uh, if you remember, Churchill may be thought of as the Prime Minister who won or Britain, the Second World War, but Churchill was voted out after the Second World War, and the Labour Party came in and nationalized a number of industries and went in for major, very major health health process. So leftist movements and communist movements were quite strong within Europe as well, and this is also something America was concerned, Western Europe, America was concerned about the possibility of select countries slipping slowly into the Soviet, uh, Russian, <coughs> Greece, in fact, in 1948, I think, had elections and the communists actually won uh, in, in, to make sure that they did not get, they did not stabilize in Greece, uh, the, 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 the new government, uh, the, the Western Europe, in, led by led by Great Britain in particular, but supported very heavily by America, or in fact, maybe led by America, but the tangible actor from the European side was Great Britain. They actually sent aid and, and troops and ammunition, military supplies to the non-communists to fight the communist government, which had been legitimately elected after a vote. And there was a civil war for about four years. Uh, in the, in the course of which <laughs> the communists were defeated and Greece managed to stay out of the Soviet orbit. Anyway, so, so, so these were the risks that in Asia, the big risk America saw was Southeast Asia. Because Southeast Asia, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, these were actually either French colonies 
or regions heavily uh, influenced by France, and France had to leave, or France was in the process of leaving. The, uh, as you know, France was forced out of Vietnam in the mid. In 1954, Dien Bien Phu, that battle, famous battle, where Ho Chi Minh and uh, the Viet Cong, his army, uh, communists. Now the Amer Americans were concerned that Vietnam, which borders China, was going to come heavily under under uh, in the in the Chinese orbit of influence, go communist because uh, Ho Chi Minh was uh, the leader of the communist faction and he'd won the war. No, he certainly beaten the French. So what was going to happen to Vietnam? And the Americans were concerned that, you know, in this void will come China and then Vietnam goes communist. Once Vietnam goes communist, then the neighboring countries, Cambodia, Cambodia, uh, um, possibly Malaysia, possibly Indonesia, these countries can all go communist as well. So America actually physically stepped in as France was leaving. And then, as you know, through the mid-60s, late 60s, uh, right up to 1974, America fought a war in Vietnam. So, so it was a period of Cold War for Western Europe, Japan, and America, but, the, the, but it would break out into a hot war wherever, as in Greece, as in Vietnam, wherever uh, America felt to be stopped through military means. So that's the second feature of it. The first is very high growth. The second is the Cold War and all that entails. The third uh, important feature of this is the incredible peace and prosperity within Western Europe, Japan, and America. The numerous mutual assistance agreements, the big amount of aid that America gave these countries, but lots of apex uh, economic coordination bodies that, that consist of member countries, but the, you know, the bigger countries in Western Europe, America, and, and of course, Japan by itself. America and Japan by themselves. And, uh, you know, the G8, which now is the G20, which is, you know, part of the uh, international organizations that, that meet to discuss, uh, you know, common, uh, common, really mainly economic uh, uh, issues uh, that, that need to be resolved for the greater economic benefit of all the um, but the creation, this period saw the creation of the European Common Market, which uh, grew from just six countries in the beginning. It's now about 28 or 29 countries, but it had its roots then in the period after the Second World War. So, so international cooperation, you know, inter European cooperation, um, and, and really within the capitalist countries, these, the Europe, Japan, and America, opening of trade um, and all, all countries trying, aiming slowly to reduce controls so that there could be cross investment uh, within the major, major economic blocks uh, based on comparative advantage of trade, etc. Comparative advantage, the comparative advantage countries had in, in particular industries. So I'll come, but these are just the three sort of overriding, uh, overarching uh, observations about this uh, about this period. Now, what you know, you know, coming down to what uh, actually what took shape after the Second World War, a lot of the initiatives. That the uh, that the powers, uh, the great economic powers, military powers, non-communist, a, a lot of the initiatives were based on what they learned from the Great Depression, and we'll just look at, uh, we'll just look at those things first uh, before I go on to the mixed economy itself. Uh, so it was based on learning from the Great Depression. Uh, the as you know, the gold standard had gone. Something needed to be put into in the place of the gold standard because uh, currencies 
uh, for countries to trust each other's currency, there had to be some common yardstick. It used to be the gold standard. So the fact that countries, all countries accepted and had the currencies that allowed trade. Now, if the gold standard had gone, how would you trust a currency? How would you trust particular currencies? Uh, if, if you're buying something, if you're making paper, you bought, Germany has bought something from America and is going to make payment in dollars a year from now, what's the exchange rate of the dollar going to be? In the days of the gold standard, that was all word to gold and you could hedge through gold. But now if gold's gone, what will come in its place? So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, that was one important issue that needed address. Also, the issues that needed address involved trade, you know, the trade barriers uh, that had been put up in the 1920s and 30s, as we discussed, uh, were really uh, very obstructive. Uh, they deepened the Great Depression greatly. So trade, new, a new view on trade had to be taken, and a new view had to be taken on multilateral assistance, in countries assisting it, uh, uh, each other with uh, the surplus countries helping the deficit countries. Uh, you know, with low that the deficit countries could grow faster, and you know, and their faster growth would also benefit the surplus countries because because. As they grew, as the deficit countries or countries uh, that that had that had smaller economies, uh, as they grew, then their demand would turn into orders, products, opportunities for companies from the developed countries. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the general background uh, uh, on this period. Now we'll just, if if this is all now at the moment, uh, you know, too much of a mishmash. We will go through all the subjects I've talked about uh, in detail and, and with, um, with clarity. So, so first, let's just see the... Let's just recap. Uh, uh, as I said, the most formative illustration or, de or, or developmental illustration of the very strong development that happened uh, was based on learnings from the Great Depression. So, so what were the learnings from the Great Depression? What were the features of the Great Depression? Remember, we're talking about just after the Second World War. So we're talking about the, the these uh, leaders of these countries, uh, you know, uh, Japan, Western Europe, America, Great Britain was a big colonial power still at that point in, in 1946. It's South Asia, Malaya. Uh, and many parts of Africa. We want to create a future that's different from the past. And, uh, you know, what, uh, what have we learned uh, about our experience in the, in the two decades before the Second World War, the Great Depression and then recovering from it, what have we learned that we can make sure uh, we, we can address those learnings to make sure we don't slip into uh, all those uh, bad habits, uh, into all those uh, methods of economic management uh, that actually accentuated and deepened the Great Depression. So, just to recap quickly, the major yeah, the United States was really the that's uh, really the catalyst behind universal behind the spread of the depression uh, globally. Uh, the depression was the deepest in America, lasted lo longest in America. Uh, you, we've been through this. I'm not going to spend time on it, but just to recap quickly, economic imbalances within America, overproduction because of very unequal income distribution. And this was addressed because America wanted to go on producing. And if incomes aren't enough, then all right, let people borrow. So too rapid credit expansion. Uh, and at the same time, European indebtedness, Europe 
uh, owed America money. America insisted about $10 billion. America insisted on repayment. The only way US, uh, um, Europe returned the money was by selling goods to America. America put up sanctions against that. Uh, in return, the Europeans put up sanctions, or not sanctions, sorry, that's the wrong word, tariffs, tariff value, not sanctions. Very high. That was, you know, just referred to the gold standard. Remember the problem with the gold standard? Some, you know, if some countries surplus, if one country is surplus, another country is going to be deficit. That's, you know, I mean, you know, globally, the balance of trade will, will be zero, but in between countries, it can't be zero. Some will have deficit. And if you had a deficit in the gold standard, uh, under the gold standard regime, as you will remember, you then had to contract your, your economy. I told you the problem with that gold standard. I told you uh, countries are contracting, expanding, contracting, expanding, very unstable, very bad for trade, very bad for continuity. Third, policy failures. Reliance on market-based recovery and waiting too long to use monetary and fiscal tools, uh, thereby allowing bank failures to accumulate. You remember they... The, the belief was that, you know, this is the creative destruction of capitalism. It will all repair itself. Government will, if government interferes, it, it will screw things up. So let the market resolve. And then, as, as you know, because of debt deflation, et cetera, the market was not just, things just got worse and worse. There was no sign of recovery from within market impulses. Then Roosevelt comes in and he realizes that this bank collapse is, is, is the biggest problem we have because the conveyor belt of the economy, the, the, you know, the, the, the mechanism that takes people's savings, converts them into loans, investment, which then create employment, that, that holds, you know, the banks have broken down, that, that conveyor belt has broken down. So, you know, you know what he did to restore the, the confidence in the banking system. Uh, and then the, <clears throat> then the other things he did along with this, which is uh, the separation of investment banks and commercial banks, the creation of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, I think insuring all deposits over, I think, $25,000 at the time, uh, and then the creation of the Security and Exchange Commission, etc. So stabilization of the banking system. Aggressive government intervention, in particular, in particular, well, through interest rates, he cut interest rates, but also through fiscal policy to create jobs, spending on infrastructure. 
to provide relief against poverty, improve social welfare. The aim being, you know, there's everything in America. There are factories, but the huge number of factories, world's best machinery, but they're empty. Workers standing outside, but they're they they're unemployed. Uh, the there's a whole consumer population starved for goods, but the goods aren't coming out. Prices are falling, unemployment is rising, GDP is shrinking, trade is shrinking. So how do you stop this? If the market, if there's such colossal market failure, well, if you remember demand, just you have to inject, you have to reinvigorate demand, and that was you know the advice of Keynes, and that this book of his we were discussing had come out slightly before. Keynes had a lot of influence at that time with American economic thinkers and with Roosevelt, or let's say Keynes's influence had a lot of thinking with Roosevelt, had, had a lot of uh, resonance uh, with Roosevelt, and he began to the program of uh, expenditure, which created jobs, income, and then that income uh, uh, induced companies to start hiring workers again and producing goods, and hiring workers created more demand, and the economy got back to recovery, and then uh, finally, Roosevelt ditched the gold standard. So, first crisis of the modern economy taught valuable lessons that a fiscal policy could be used. Remember, before the depression, the general um, econ the economic managers of, of major countries uh, didn't think that, thought the deficits in peacetime were failure. Yes, in war you can run deficits. But in peacetime, the government's duty is balanced budgets or surplus budgets. Government should not create uh, imbalances in the economy through injecting uh, money and cash. Through If it's spent more taxes, it will be expanding the economy and that expansion would be inflationary. Government should not do it. But here you learned that there are circumstances when the government must do it. There is no option. Monetary policy, you, you, well, I, I, I suppose you know what monetary, the big, um, uh, the big uh, items that come under the headlines of monetary and fiscal in terms of economic policies, monetary has to do with money supplies, so it has to do primarily with actions of the central bank. And, um, and expand credit, by lowering its policy rate, the state bank, the central bank can expand credit by open market operations, by buying um, uh, securities, government securities from banks and adding to money supply. Uh, the central bank can all requirements so that banks don't have to block money with the central bank or in government bills. And it can also reverse the direction uh, of money. It can contract money supply by re reversing, by reversing what it was doing in, with respect to all these things. It can raise interest rates. It can contract money supply by selling the government securities to banks. <laughs> it can raise the reserve requirements. All that goes into monetary policy. Fiscal is really the essentially government actions with respect to taxes and expenditure, which are all areas where government decides, um, where government makes the fundamental decision of what taxes are going to be, or what duties are going to be, or various levies are going to be, and all of them affect economic activity. Uh, and changes in them all, you know, affect economic activity. They can be expansionary, they can be contractionary. So, so here the conclusion was, that that here you know as we're coming out of, the, uh, uh, of this we're out of the Great Depression now we're sitting here after the Second World War, and you know now we're convinced we meaning these economic managers are convinced that uh, the old way of looking at monetary and fiscal policy in other words don't use monetary policy until there's inflation, don't touch it. <laughs> Is not true. Fiscal never run deficits. That's not true. In peacetime, never run deficits. And that's not true. At times, you have to run them. Now, where does that leave the debate between those who argue in favor of market forces, laissez-faire, non-interference of government, 
and those who believe government have to interfere has to interfere that government expenditure at certain times and government intervention very active intervention is critical uh, what have we learned what did the great depression teach us you know on the one hand it's very easy to say that yes the great depression taught us that the market can fail and then government uh, intervention is necessary all right maybe maybe we accept that we meaning the the lesser fair guys also call them the supply side guys also call them washington consensus guy neo liberal all those terms mean the same thing um, and on the other side you've got the interventionists keynesians so has have we learned anything i mean is one who's right and the answer is you know there's there is still debate it's interesting that the american presidents of the 1920s reflect this debate so here's calvin coolidge president from 23 to 29 then you had hoover then you had roosevelt these are you know two these are two statements made by calvin coolidge during the depression as america's edging into the depression the business of america is business meaning that's you know this is the it's the ultimate land of the brave home of the free it's the ultimate free market <clears throat> it is such a, a blessed land rich rich soil all metals and minerals you want oil you know america's got everything everyone can go out and do well and that's what everyone should do don't ask the state to do anything for you this work is what we give it to you so the business of america is business that's why you're here second statement don't expect to build up the weak by pulling down the strong this is the whole business uh, that has to do with lessening you remember lessening inequality you remember the 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 issue of wages in america you know while profits grew very rapidly wages grew profits i think grew 40% you know in that period of time in the 1920s wages only about 8% uh, which which was plugged with credit that gap between rising production and and uh, very slow growth in wages that gap was filled by by credit uh, anyway but if you said to coolidge listen uh, force your 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 capitalists force your employers your big industrialists to pay more uh force them to uh tax them so that you can put money aside for labor welfare get labor don't expect to build up the weak by pulling down the strong no let the industrialist carry on you know he will create jobs in the future the more money he makes the more he'll invest the more people will be employed and sooner or later unemployment will become so small that when as industry seeks to raise wages and that's the theory of the trickle down they got another american president who comes in just after coolidge and he has a view that is completely seems completely contradictory to this it says the test of our progress is not whether we add to the abundance of those who have much it's whether we provide enough to those that to those who have little now you know this sounds coolidge sounds like a brute franklin uh, uh, roosevelt sounds like a moralist it sounds like a priest it sounds like a preacher that be kind to people but neither 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 really uh coolidge wasn't a brute and roosevelt wasn't a preacher they both took firm stock of what would be best for economies uh not people's health but economy what would be best for economy is the long term the supply side is i've told you uh, said that in the long term what would be best for the whole country everyone for everyone's income uh government's job is simply to create a, a, a conducive most conducive environment possible for investment low taxes very low regulation 
don't put controls on capital. Uh, let the private sector lead. Government get out of the way, get out of managing anything. Um, don't interfere through fiscal and monetary policy. Monetary policy, use it only to curb inflation. Don't use it to try and encourage uh, demand. Uh, uh, and on the fiscal side, run, run flat budgets. So and they, no, this, was, this was a very practical view. This is what they thought. And they still do. Many, many still do. The Republican Party in America is full of these people. So, so, so were the conservatives in England, the Conservative Party. Uh, you know, they, they on balance would come out on this side. Not all of England, Labour would come out on the other side, but the Conservatives who are governing now would. Um, so, so it's still a very strong view. On the other side, you've got the people who believe in government intervention. Yeah, you know, Roosevelt, uh, <clears throat> they argue that boom or bust, when boom or busts happen, market overreach, they go out of control. And when the collapse comes, then the market cannot stage its own recovery. So it's best that you allow government intervention so that the market doesn't either go towards boom or go towards bust. And, and this, the government can see coming. The government ha has enough data, enough information. The government can see that you know these, there's overheating or there's undue cooling. And the economy needs you know, the fire stoke. It needs a bit of prodding. It needs a bit of encouragement. So government should intervene. For welfare benefits, you know, yes, they're humanitarian, but leave the humanitarian side aside. Uh, leave the humanitarian part aside. Uh, you need demand. So, so if we, the state, can tax the rich and therefore provide labor with free health, free education, pensions, <laughs> and often free housing, then we take away the, the need for people to save and therefore, they'll spend whatever they earn, and that has to be good for our manufacturers. That has to be so. You know, both are looking at what creates optimal levels of production, but from different angles. And the debate, as I said, still goes on. Now, this business of the welfare state, the Europeans have been doing it since the end of the 19th century, and uh, the Americans were very reluctant. I've got a presentation on welfare states. Uh, in Europe, the Scandinavians have the most aggressive welfare state. In other words, the, where taxes are highest and welfare benefits the most. Scandinavia. Then France and Germany are in between. In Europe, Britain has, has the lowest uh, welfare levels you know, relative to Scandinavia. And as I said, France and Germany are in between. Um, America has welfare, stat welfare levels even below Britain, really quite low, very low welfare. But that's that you know that's that's their choice. That that is, as I said, this demand and supply side thing has not been. The uh, now. If you read about the Depression, Great Depression, it depends on, you know, you keep asking, people have asked me for books on the Depression. There are a number of books. I mean, there is, it's the subject most written about in economic history. But most books take, you know, take one side or the other. The supply side is, you know, led by ec economists like this guy Ludwig von Mises, Hayek, who Austria there is slightly misleading because they taught and were highly influential in both America and England. And then, of course, Friedman, who was later than them. Uh, so, you know, these are all uh, later than the 1970s, 60s, 70s. These are all people on the supply side. You've got Keynes on the other side. Now, if you, <laughs> if you read about the Great Depression, in in very crude, would say say 
you know, to the Keynesians, what the hell are you talking about? You're talking utter and complete garbage. Of course, the market was capable of recovery. Of course, the market could have saved itself. It's just that the banks collapsed. And that was the fault of the regulator. The regulator had the responsibility of the market to make sure banks don't fail. And, and if banks hadn't failed, the depression would not have been a depression. It would have been a normal business cycle recession. So you can't say that the great uh, uh, depression illustrates the failure of the private sector. Uh, what we think it represents the failure of was the Federal Reserve Bank. They also say that recovery would have been, if the banks had been saved, recovery would have come. And what FDR, the steps FDR took really distorted uh, American towards investment on the part of business in America by excessively pro-labor policies, uh, fiscal policies or expenditure, government expenditure that increases the cost of labor. Uh, also, this uh, you, you remember the uh, um, the, uh, the uh, this body that Roosevelt created, uh, this council between uh, um, big employers and heads of unions to to uh, to discuss their, their concerns as they went forward uh, with an urging to industries more. Otherwise, we'll have the depression again. If you don't pay them enough, they're going to borrow, and then we'll have the depression again. So, so these people are minus high people on this side would argue that uh, Roosevelt's uh, fiscal uh, policies and the steps he took uh, increased the cost of labor in the long run, reduced the profit incentive because uh, how much if you're going to be if you're going to pay high taxes. And if your wages are going to go on rising, then your incentive to go on investing is diminished. Uh, and 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 what this did was to postpone economic recovery. Labor lazy, lazy. They create the wrong. Uh, they create the wrong culture. The you know the, the poorer people instead of striving harder, being more adventurous. Uh, you know, wait for the union to go and argue with the with the employers and get higher for them. So instead of learning and you know technically improving their performance, they they become uh, lazy and uh, you know wages uh, improvement in individual contribution. Now you can agree with that, <laughs> or you can say. This is a great distortion, a uh, distorted reading of what had actually happened. Now you're saying banks should, you can tell these people, the Mises, Hayek, Friedman supporters, supply side supporters, you can say, interfere. but now you're saying that the banks should have been saved by the Fed using public money. Is that, but that's not part of your philosophy. That's the, not the free market philosophy. In your philosophy, the free market philosophy, the free market creates its own. Not, the government doesn't give it. The government doesn't contribute out of its own pocket. And if the government was going to bail out the banks, where would that money come from? The government would have to run a deficit. So you're defeating your own arguments. And if you're saying that it was good to have labor salaries low. In other words, it was good, good to have the, of, uh, the surplus from production. It was good to tilt that entirely equal, largely in favor of profits, <coughs> less in favor of wages. <coughs> if you're saying that that's how it should go on being in the future, then tell us how you're going to create adequate demand in the economy. Uh, the answer is really debt. You want these guys to go and borrow, and then they'll borrow too much. So anyway, I just let me just leave it there because I spent more time on this than all. Still, very much issues of political economy. Let's leave this aside and get to the golden years. 
Now, I say 71, uh, 48 to 71. Actually, the this is the period when 24 years, the growth was extremely high. After 71, it starts stabilizing. And by 75, this whole model of the mixed economy, which had been adopted by everyone, even America, even Republican presidents, they had it adopted. <laughs> and everywhere in Europe, <clears throat> this model, which had done so well, collapsed. We'll see why it collapsed. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little later. Now, the remarkable thing about this period is the speed and strength of economic recovery uh, and its sustained momentum. This was based on three pillars. Now, please note this. It's important that you understand uh, what we're going to discuss in the context of these three pillars. They, they, these were the overarching institutional and historical developments in this period, these three different things uh, that held up this, uh, uh, held up the umbrella, held up the ceiling uh, that allowed growth, growth uh, to proceed as fast as it did. The, uh, the first pillar is the US role as small in the second. Before the Second World War, there were six superpowers. Not superpowers, there were six powers, major powers. Japan, Germany, France, Britain, America, and Italy. Uh, Russia, before the Second World War, so, and Germany, France, Britain, Italy, and America. You can also add Russia, although people didn't know quite how strong Russia was, and Russia was had withdrawn into itself. It was not evident in international relations uh, as exerting its weight or even trading with the rest of the world. So you didn't quite, you knew that Russia was strong, didn't quite know its strength. After the Second World War, there's just two powers left. U.S., and Russia. Now, the US fearing communism, as I said earlier, uh, moved very rapidly to create alliances with all non communist countries. Uh, and these alliances were based on economic assistance, uh, making it attractive and easy to trade for these countries to trade with America, also providing military support. Uh, Western Europe, you see, in the in the whole, if you again look at the map of the world, the America wanted to influence the whole periphery of countries around the communist bloc. So you have Japan on one side, you've got Western Germany, you've got Western Europe, starting with Germany. Remember, Eastern Europe's been swallowed. It's part of the Soviet zone of influence. So, so you know, uh, Western Europe, and then, then come to the south, Turkey. Um, Iran, Pakistan, that TIP that I put in. <laughs> so with all these countries, with all these regions, America created grant arrangements, loan arrangements, and defense arrangements. With Western Europe, America had NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, with the other blocs, you know, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, etc., coming down to Indonesia, it had CETO, Southeast Asia, <laughs> and for Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan, uh, I don't think you remember it, but there was something called CENTRO, C -E, Central Eastern Nations Treaty Organization, which uh, Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan had signed up for, and so had some countries of the Arab world, Iraq and Jordan. But then there was a revolution in Iraq in 1958. Uh, the king was overthrown. Um, um, the Iraqi military took over Iraq, the Ba'ath movement. It was a left of center movement, and the and the new Iraqi government was very pro-Russia. So it didn't. It withdrew from center. Once it withdrew, Jordan also withdrew. 
So Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan then didn't go ahead and said, do we form something with RCD? <laughs> Let's leave that aside, but this is just to describe the arrangements uh, America chose to make. And we'll talk more about American influence in a minute. The second was global institutional arrangements to underpin economic led to the Great Depression. So these are the three institutions that set up, and we'll just talk about them. Um, they're called the Britain Board Institutions. That BWI refers to Britain Woods Institution. <coughs> it has no meaning. Britain Woods has no meaning other than that these agreements were signed in a place called Britain, Britain, Britain Woods, which I, I think is near Washington in America. Uh, now, they were set up as sister institutions to the United Nations. Uh, um, uh, and a common frame, framework for making economic policies. We'll talk more about them in a second. Then, as I said earlier, strong international cooperation through other UN forums, you know, the G20, the G8, etc. And the, uh, the, these were based, what these, each of these institutions was going to do was to, to uh, reinforce uh, uh, international economic uh, trade and cooperation and policies in such a way that you know the Great Depression would become impossible, that you could not step back to the Great Depression. Again, we'll talk more about this in a second. The rise of social market economies, Keynesianism, uh, and these <clears throat> these policies involved government intervention, both monetary and fiscal. It also involved government management of certain industries where the private sector would not go initially uh, or would not go with sufficient uh, investment. So steel, mining, heavy industries, long gestation, uh, taking a long time for returns to come and basic to the economy. So, so for example, you know, mining, you, most of Europe produces electricity from coal in those days. And if you had people making, if you had the private sector goal to establish, secondly, the, uh, uh, the private sector, would, why would it go into coal? Well, it would go into coal because it expected to earn a profit equal to its profit from doing something else like making cars or making consumer goods of some kind. <laughs> Similarly, if it went into steel industry, it would have the same purpose. Now. Uh, both these industries would cost a lot of capital and would take a lot of time. So governments thought that it's best for us, for government itself, to manage the steel industry, to manage mining, because we are not, we as the government are not concerned about profit. We're concerned about earning enough to keep our operations going. But we're not going to look for profit. Therefore, we will be able to offer these goods to our private sector at a lower price and earlier and sooner because we can make the investment. If we have to print notes, we'll do that. We have the money, we can create the money. And aid that get, get, gets, provides the lowest cost. The private sector today is In, in quite quite the same by the government. You could disagree with that, but that was the argument. That was also an argument. Manage all infrastructure because roads, bridges, again, you know, take a huge amount of money and you can't charge what you want to. You know, I mean, these are public services. So on buses and, and, and tubes underground, you charge what the common man can afford. Again, you're not there for profit. You're there to provide a public service. The private sector won't want to do that. The private sector won't want to be in a business that, that's at break even. So, so these are all for all these reasons. Uh, you know, keep the government will go in and do it. So the government will also, in many parts of industry of infrastructure. So the, so the mixed economy model was this aspect of physically uh, being responsible for 
<coughs> some businesses and infrastructure, and then also intervening through monetary infrastructure. Well, but, but what, what this experience of the 30, 25, 30 years showed that uh, it worked very well. The government supplemented by the private sector ensured high investment, high production, inflation stayed low, unemployment stayed low, uh, and the government was, you know, extremely active. It worked, is the point. But then it collapsed, and we'll come to that after. Stagflation, stagflation in the mid 70s. Yeah. Who, who knows what, can someone tell you what stagflation is? Continuous increase in the inflation. Why is it different from inflation then? So because there's also no- In this case, the, the economic activities remain stagnant, but the inflation continues to rise in stagflation. It's, stag it's stagnation with rising prices, which is a curious phenomenon. Um, and it hasn't really existed in the world. It, it did, it exploded in the mid 70s. Uh, and we, we'll come to that. We'll see what were the factors behind it. Does anyone remember the Phillips curve? Phillips curve? Uh, this is one of the problems of not having a chart near one or a board, blackboard. The Keynes's argument, which I haven't talked about yet, and we don't have to dwell on it, but I just need to illustrate. I need you to understand what the Phillips curve is. Uh, you know, think of your usual grid, x-axis, y-axis, and think of a line that slopes that slopes from left to right, like that, but in a curve. Now, that slope measures employment on the y-axis and inflation on the x-axis. So you've got inflation, unemployment. But that curve shows you Start from the right hand side. It shows you that inflation, inflation reduces as, sorry, employment increases, unemployment reduces as inflation rises. That's what Keynes's argument was that a little bit of inflation is very good for the economy. <laughs> and that economies, in fact, should run at a certain amount of inflation. It's healthier for the foreseeable future. Remember, he was writing about the this is the late 40s, early 50s, uh, that uh, a little bit of inflation is very good for investment. Now, why would, how would that be true? Moderate inflation, I'm not talking about extreme inflation, moderate inflation, say 5 6%. You know, now they want to run inflation under 2%, but Keynes was talking about 4 or 5%, not 5 6 4 5 Tell me why, you know, what argument can you think of that would say, justify, uh, you know, inflation, Four and so five percent. Uh, yeah. So it, it could be because of uh, having an Im increased employment rate would also create uh, demand in the economy. And if the demand is there, so obviously prices would increase also. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's along those. It's, yeah. The, um, the answer is along those lines. If you've got four or five percent inflation, the manufacturer, I mean, government can't stop him if that's what inflation is doing. <coughs> I mean, the government can't penalize him. He's not being an extortionist. <coughs> and his competitors would do the same thing. But his wages won't go up. Remember, this is the time when wages were a big part of the cost of production. They're not now because our machineries are now much more sophisticated, need much less labor. In those days, you needed a lot of labor as well. Labor was a big component in cost. So 
So you put your, you as the industry, you put your up, your cash flow increases, but you don't pay out higher wages till next year. Because, because this year's inflation, labor will have to come cover out of this year's salaries. The adjustment for this year's inflation, they've asked for in next year's round of wage increases. So, so what, what, what inflation of 4 or 5% does, it front ends cash flows for manufacturers. Therefore, they expand production. They, they, they you know, add to their uh, machinery. They increase employment. And that all goes towards you know, higher growth. So Keynes' argument was there's a little bit of inflation. But then, you know, if I could have drawn that curve, I, I, see, I, I told you that, that the Phillips curve went like this. It, it didn't come down in, at a 45 degrees. It went like this. Because as unemployment reduces, as you come towards the end of the, uh, as you come to about three or four percent unemployment, well, three or four percent unemployment is what they call transient unemployment. You always have something like that in the economy because there are people between jobs or there are people ill or there are people sick. So there will always be three, maybe three percent. But but if you're, you, you're moving along this curve, if you reach the point so small that a further uh, need for workers will strain the labor market because there is not enough unemployment and that will accelerate wage increase because now the available pool of labor compared to the needs of manufacturers is too small. So if you're going to look for more labor out of this market, you will have to raise wages. And then the workers will come. They'll come from abroad. They'll migrate from the next country. They'll come from somewhere and pay higher, high wages. Enough. But, but then, then you go, to, once you get to that point, you go into a vicious cycle because wages then start going up very fast. So you as the manufacturer then start putting your price up very fast. <clears throat> and then you reach a point where inflation is so high that labor will say, we're not going to wait next year for the adjustment for this labor we wanted this year. I don't know if, if, if uh, is, that, is, that, is that understood by and large? I mean, have I made myself vaguely clear? Any, any responses? So it, it seems that uh, uh, somehow a uh, little bit of unemployment and uh, inflation both are actually necessary. Yeah. Yes, I mean, you, you have to have some slack in the labor market. Uh, you have to, and, 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 and therefore, this is a term that Milton Friedman came up with, uh, this concept of Nairu, N-A-I-R-U, which stands for non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. In other words, and this is from Friedman, it wasn't from Keynes. It's interesting that Friedman should have coined this concept because the concept is essentially Keynes did. But <clears throat> what, what uh, Friedman is saying is that governments must recognize that, that after, a, if you reduce unemployment beyond a point, you are going to move into accelerating wages, therefore accelerating prices, therefore accelerating inflation. So you have to keep your unemployment below the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. And I think he worked out that it was about 4%. <laughs> now, <clears throat> we'll see why why this this uh, why, we'll see what happened why 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 the economy reached the point where inflation accelerated and it wasn't only because of labor it wasn't people we'll we'll come to that let's discuss it it's it's, it's a debatable it's an issue with lots of views on we'll come to it later anyway this destroyed this stagflation destroyed the success of the mixed economy model because you had very high inflation, low growth, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, labor protests, lot 
knockouts, the coal miners strike in Britain. Britain went one whole winter with uh, in what they call brownouts. They're not blackouts, brownouts, because there wasn't enough coal, because the coal miners were in strike and they were taking on Mrs. Thatcher. So, and similarly, you had the aircraft controllers union going on strike in America. Um, so labor was really out and, uh, and you know, very aggressive. So under those conditions, there was a sort of political, you know, crisis as well. And the government said, the government said uh, this whole business of managing demand, pandering to labor, uh, you know, high taxes, uh, you know, all this is discouraging investment. And that's our biggest problem. People aren't investing. And it's all because of these damn policies where government, you know, interferes too much in the economy. We want government out. And we are going to go on a program of privatization, deregulation, uh, <clears throat> privatization, deregulation, and liberalization of the economy. So, in other words, back to the free market. Back to the free market. So, so we had the free market which collapsed under Roosevelt, or just before Roosevelt came. We had the mixed economy model, which in, which gets thrown out in the mid seventies. We go back to the free market. And then what I'm saying as an aside is that even this free market thing in 2008 with the financial crisis, it collapses. Now governments intervene to save banks on a massive scale. Trillions of dollars have been spent. Growth has shrunk in Europe and America. Inequality is huge. So this, this period from the mid-70s up to 2008, very successful in some ways, globalization uh, and the creation of the international supply chains, very successful. But but, but was it, but, you know, is it pure free market now? Now, when I bailed out banks on such a massive scale, uh, and, and Europe and America are still somewhat, they're not in recession, but their growth is down to 1, 1.5, 2%, from being 3%, 4%, 5% before 2008. Sorry, there was a question. Someone was asking uh, yes, a question. Sir, uh, was the major reason for the 2008 recession was the mortgage-backed securities that were uh, like... That was the immediate trigger, the collapse of the subprime market. And the subprime market was the uh, the lowest end of the mortgage market, the, the, uh, the you know, the, the, the lowest income earners who borrowed for mortgages. Uh, they were called subprime borrowers. It was the collapse of that market. But that was simply the trigger. Uh, sitting on top of subprime was a mountain of debt. So when the subprime cracked, the whole mountain, much of the mountain of debt crumbled. And that mountain of debt was not subprime. So yes, subprime was a trigger. But when we look at the 2008 crisis, it was really the uh, reckless and very aggressive behavior of banks uh, trying to make too much money and speculating a lot. So there are different reasons for it, but certainly it was triggered by the, the subprime segment of the mortgage market. Oh, thank you. Okay, and, and that's why I'm saying the Great Depression was caused by overproduction of goods. Remember that necessitated credit. <laughs> the 2008 wasn't overproduction of good, goods. <clears throat> it was overproduction of financial products. And we'll talk about that. Now let's go back. Three, Remember the, the three pillars. The first pillar was the U.S. as superpower. Now, who won, who won the Second World War? I mean, who was the victor? I know the Allies were the victors. But, <clears throat> but which country, you think, is really responsible for uh, breaking the back of you know, the, the, the sheer dominance of the German army in Europe? The, uh, not just the German army, the German Air Force. The German military machine. Germany conquered Poland in about three days, conquered France in about three weeks, and Germany was ruling Europe. This is this is in, in, by September 1940. Germany marched into Poland. By June 41 or March or April 41, Germany had swallowed France. Britain, the British army had come out in support of France. They they were chased back. At, uh, from a place called Dunkirk, about 400,000 British, what they call the British Expeditionary Force. They were sitting in Europe to defend France, help France defend itself against the German machine. 
but the French couldn't put up much of a defense and the British were chased to the <coughs> northern coast of France <coughs> opposite <coughs> up on to the channel <coughs> just 30 miles 25 miles away from Britain and they had to escape on boats and the Germans could have captured the entire army <coughs> the British army they could have taken them all prisoner but they let them escape well that's why they let them escape you know let's leave that aside that goes into Hitler's uh, assessment at the time that Britain would not enter a long war in Europe his assessment that let them go we will do a deal with Britain we'll tell Britain to keep its empire leave Europe to us and the British will agree because the British want to keep their empire it's more important than the Europe than the ties with Europe and besides they'll trade with us as well we'll control Europe and they'll trade with us so so anyway, that was his belief. So he let the now now this was 19. So by April 41, Hitler's got France, Italy is an ally, Mussolini, Spain is an ally, Franco. Spain is also a fascist government. Italy is a fascist government, of course, Hitler is fascist, and Franco, uh, the, the military chief who had won a civil war against the Republicans who were leftists, socialists, who, or, or let's say who were the democratic parties, they happened to be leftists, who were supported by Russia. Uh, anyway, Franco supported by Germany and Italy at once. So, so Scandinavia has become beautiful. So Hitler had all of Europe, April 41. By April 45, Hitler had lost the war. So what happened in between? that made Hitler lose the war, or that broke the might, broke the backbone of uh, German military might. It was actually the invasion of Russia. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Tell me more. Sir, so they were pinned down in um, Stalingrad. I think what that was the name of the city. Um, the army was surrounded. They couldn't advance towards Moscow and they were eventually pushed back and uh, in france we had uh, the allied forces on the beaches of normandy and they 19, were yeah yeah one second that was july 1944 three and a half years after the conquest of france by germany yeah so we had so, the, the germans had two fronts one was with russia and the other was with uh, the allies yeah the, the thing to remember is that there is very little doubt for three and a half years till July 44 the allies meaning the British Americans and the Americans were not in Europe if they were fighting the Germans they were fighting them in North Africa maybe a little in southern Italy but they were not in Europe they were not in Europe for three, three years and four months <laughs> So Hitler did not have two fronts <clears throat> for three and a half years. There was only one front. And like you said, that was Russia. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Hitler had a treaty with Russia, signed a treaty with them. It was called the Pact of Steel, I think, in 1940. That we won't attack you. Uh, we Germans will not attack you. We, we, let's sign a peace treaty. I'm going to take over Western Europe. And, uh, you know, in the fullness of time, you know, you look after all of Eastern Europe, that's not our interest. Signed that treaty, but in spite of that treaty, in April 41, Hitler attacked uh, Russia. Now, the next three years is a story of the Russians first retreating. Uh, Hitler was only about 20 miles. If you go to Moscow and you drive in from, I think it's called Shrenmat, it's about two, three airports, Moscow, Shred the main airport, the old airport, Shredmat, Mayo, something airport. Uh, and you drive it through there, about 15 miles outside Moscow, you see a big iron cross lying on its side. It's, it's about uh, 150 feet high. Or the arms are about 100 feet. It's, uh, it's that cross is lying there with sort of barbed wire all around it. Now, that is the furthest that the Germans had got. They were only about uh, between 15 and 20 miles outside Moscow. The trouble was they went all over the place. They came towards Moscow, um, 
in the center, they went to Leningrad in the north, and they went to Stalingrad in the south. Uh, it was then called Stalingrad. It's called gone, Leningrad is now St. Petersburg, and Stalingrad has gone back to its old name. I'm forgetting Vostok. I'm not sure. I'm forgetting its uh, new name. So it, Stalingrad was a communist name. It had now it's gone back to its pre-communist name. Anyway. So, and yes, the, the Russian Fifth Army was, was surrounded in, in, uh, in Stalingrad and had to surrender. But that was, that was after the Germans had been battered. And they were battered because the Russians retreated. The Russians, like they did with Napoleon, the Russians let the Germans come in. It wasn't all intentional. They were partly pushed back as well. Then the Russians started building, developing their army, developing their... They didn't really... They feared Hitler, but they hadn't expected him to attack them so soon. They were not really ready munition-wise. They spent uh, a good year, two years, building building enough capacity in armor and in planes. And eventually, when the uh, Soviet war machine then started advancing, they had better tanks. The Germans, Germans were 2,000 miles away from Germany. The Russian winter was severe. The, the railway line was inadequate. In any case, the grid from west, the railway grid from Germany, as it came into Russia, the grid changed. So the old Russian, the German trains couldn't, you know, the, the Russian grid was narrower or broader, I can't remember, but they couldn't move things by train easily. In any case, uh, you know, for a long, many months of the year, snow would bog down movement of both rail and road transport. So the German army couldn't be uh, supplied. And the German army was not supplied with winter equipment, with winter uniforms. So, so the Russians slowly developed a, a supremacy in tanks. The, the, this tank, the, the T-34 that they developed, the, the Russians, many think was the, the most, uh, it may not have been the heaviest tank, like the Patton tank or the, even the Churchill tank that the British and the Americans had, but it was the most versatile, fast, uh, tank with the 360 day, 60 degree swivel gun at the top, uh, very light, very able, very maneuverable. And the Germans had not been able to develop their, their Panzer much beyond where it was as a design in 19, where it was in 1940. The Russians had made big advances. Also, the Russians had huge supremacy in aircraft and in manpower. Anyway, by the time the Russians, why do you think the Allies landed in July 1944? Why did they land in Normandy on the West Coast? Why did they land then? Why not a year ago? Why not two years ago? Because they were waiting for, well, as it so happened, the Germans were on a retreat. The Russians had got the Germans on the retreat from 1944. The German army was withdrawing with very heavy casualties. Uh, and they fought, they fought well, you know, where they fought, but they were out, badly outnumbered. Their equipment was not as good, not as fresh, and not as much as what the Russians were throwing at them. And as they were withdrawing, that's it's July 44 that the Allies decided this is a good time to attack. So that's the only time the Germans really ended up in a two-front war. And then, of course, it was unsustainable. <laughs> now, this is all <clears throat> irrelevant to <clears throat> the subject, but since I'm on it, there was one point in the Allied invasion. The, so the Russians were coming in from the east and the Allies were coming in from Normandy, from the west. There was one point in an area called the Ardennes in France where the, um, where the, 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 the Guderian, I think, the German general, who, who was the master of the Blitzkrieg strategy and he himself was a tank commander. I think it was forces under Guderian who put up at what the Americans called Battle of the Bulge. Uh, the, who put up a very, very heroic uh, tank advance against the advancing Americans, actually stopped them and turned them back. Now, the pity is that the Germans ran out of fuel. Had, had that particular uh, you know, battle of the bulge and the Germans won that, then Hitler would still have lost on the Western Front, but things would have been different. Anyway, let's leave that aside. That is, that is history. So, so the point is that Russia, remember Russia was also an ally of, had become an ally. Everybody was fighting in Germany. Uh, and, and because uh, Russia had become an ally, the, 
Americans and the British and the French did not insist that Russia should vacate all the Eastern European countries it had occupied. Remember, in chasing the Germans back uh, the, to Germany, between Germany and, and, and Russia is all of Eastern Europe. So in chasing the Germans back, the Russians were sitting in Eastern Europe. And there were communist parties there. The Russians held elections just after the, uh, just after the war in those countries, free elections. Those countries held those elections themselves. But with the Russian army in, or in your, on your soil, you know, who should win the elections? Not a surprise, the communists. So in all these countries, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, uh, Romania, you know, then these smaller countries, Belarusia, the, the Estonia, Estonia, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, in all these countries, communist parties came to power. And those communist parties requested the Russian army to stay because they said, you know, we haven't got armies of our own. The Germans have destroyed our armies. We need to defend ourselves. So please, Russian army, please stay. So that was the Russian occupation of Eastern Europe. Uh, Churchill said at the time, uh, an iron curtain is falling over Europe. That's the term, that's where the term iron curtain comes from. An iron curtain is falling over Europe. We will not see it lifted in our lifetime. Meaning we've actually given up Eastern Europe to all those countries to Russia. And the reason the Allies did not insist that the Russians withdraw is because the Russians have been at first an ally. The secondly, Russians had actually won the war. You know, the Russians had 25 million killed. There's supposed to have been 50 million casualties in the Second World War. They say that the Russian casualties were somewhere between 20 million and 25 million. So at massive loss of manpower, the Russians, the might of the German army and of the German military machine. So, so, so Stalin was not an enemy when the war ended. Stalin was an ally. And, uh, you know, they, these people, uh, in Roosevelt and Churchill, etc., and Pétain, it wasn't Pétain in France, Clemenceau, they were all quite, uh, they were quite, quite amenable to letting uh, uh, Russia get away with this uh, sort of massive, uh, uh, you know, swallowing of Eastern European territory. But whatever happens, now Russia is sitting there, uh, in Eastern Europe, and it had the atom bomb. The Americans had demonstrated they had the atom bomb when they bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Russians, up to then, it was a mystery. Did they have the bomb? Didn't they? A year later, they demonstrated they had the bomb. Uh, so now, a big fear of Russian stuff. Uh, that, you know, they've got Eastern Europe, they are communists, they're committed to communism. What's going to happen? Are we, are we going to... Are they, going to, are they going to cause communist revolutions in, in the rest of Europe? So that was the background to the, and then China, of course. And China had, had, had also gone communist. And, you know, why did China, China go communist? Think about it. Now, I'm sorry, this is all to do with the political economy rather than the economy, but it's worth remembering because some of those tensions are, we're seeing some tensions again for the first time since that period. In, in different parts of the world and, and between the superpowers, not the superpowers by fighting through proxies, but you know, America and China by themselves, <laughs> coming to, you know, types of tension that haven't existed, you know, really since the 50s. Um, I don't think there'll be any war, but, you know, trade war, yes. And uh, anyway, let's leave that aside. Why didn't the why did the Americans allow Mao to win in 1948 when the Americans were sitting in Japan with their huge army, all their aircraft carriers, uh, their destroyers? If they had gone to the help of uh, Chiang Kai Shek, we're going to do China next. But if they had gone to the help of Chiang Kai Shek, who was fighting Mao? who was very pro-America, if they'd sent him just a little bit of help, they might have been able to, maybe, maybe they wouldn't, but they might have been able to stop a victory by Mao. Why didn't they do it? Well, they didn't. They didn't do it. They, they let Mao win because they thought China was so backward. They thought Mao is a peasant leader. 
this is this groups are all peasants they all farmers who come up the hills you know they probably can't use modern machinery they haven't got planes um and you know let's leave china to itself uh, you know it's not going to bother anyone it's a you know it's a huge country they have mass famines and starvation from time to time who the hell cares who wins that was their view of china but in the korean war when the americans thought that the north koreans aided by russia were going to swallow up the rest of korea there was no north or south korea then it was just one korea but north korea borders russia and the americans thought and north korea north korea uh, actually created militias that came down from north korea to occupy towns and villages in south korea and you know japan is just there it's right next to south korea the americans were sitting in japan and they suddenly saw the they saw the north koreans coming in uh, occupying huge amounts of territory in 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 south korea and they thought what the hell you know this is again russian expansion so the americans then mobilized themselves to push the north koreans out of korea in doing that north korea also borders china in doing that they came very close to the chinese border <laughs> and the chinese also although they had not intervened in the korean war their sympathies clearly were with the north koreans who were communists so so the chinese warned the americans not to come within a certain amount of distance of china's border and the americans did so so the chinese defended themselves they attacked so then china became involved fully involved in the korean war and the americans were very surprised to discover how disciplined uh and well organized uh and uh, uh you know tactically uh you know tactically well trained the chinese navy uh, the chinese army was on on many fronts you know the chinese pushed back the americans so this then to the americans became then the korean war was eventually resolved you know through the united nations and the border was drawn and the korea was divided between north and south but but the chinese uh, the russians uh, the americans now saw china as a threat as well so it wasn't only russia it was china so so that that was the beginning of america building up this these alliances all around russia and china in the way that i described earlier <laughs> now i've gone excessively into the background of why ussr was seen as a threat but now it wasn't just ussr it also china so so that's that's uh, one significance that the us is now going to do everything to support its allies or, or to make sure it makes allies who are then are uh, in on its side in the cold war as opposed to the russian side and chinese side uh, now the second significance has to do with the creation of the united nations <laughs> before the second world war you had something like like the united nations what was it called does anyone know uh, where was it based sir the league of nations ha uh, based where uh, i think it was i know i put i i i put league of nations there so tell me where it was based and what was wrong with it why did it have to be replaced by the united nations the trouble with the league of nations this was an earlier version of the united nations except created in europe in fact in switzerland it was headquartered in geneva yeah. uh it consists consisted eventually of 63 countries but importantly america was not part of the league of nations they had, the americans had decided after the second world war under president woodrow wilson who was their president when the one threat when the first world war finished they decided they didn't <coughs> they decided the europeans are ahead of a mess the europeans are ahead of a mess they start fighting we get dragged in uh, it's not our war we don't really want to be concerned with european affairs so we're not joining the league of nations now after the second world war so america was not a member of the league of nations which is significant now Germany and Italy had become members, but then they were made to withdraw 
and that, there are foreign policy reasons why uh, why that happened, which I won't go into. Otherwise, then I'll go up another tangent. Um, and Russia was kicked out. So, so how on earth was this a League of Nations with any clout? If America isn't a part, if Russia has been thrown out, if Germany and Italy are not a part, its resolutions could not be enforced. America said this time, after the Second World War, we've got to have something like the League of Nations, but with very strong teeth. So they created the United Nations, and they said this will be in America, you know, just to show our very great commitment. So then you've got the UN. Uh, and they had uh, five security members, the five uh, members of the permanent security council, permanent members of the security council. As you know, there are 15 in our rotation, five permanent. And America uh, obviously was uh, uh, one of the five permanent members. And it's been, in foreign policy matters, it's been a very, very aggressive and participative member in, in the United Nations. Not so much in other UN bodies, but certainly in the in, in the General Assembly and particularly in stuff that comes to the Security Council. Now, the third, so that's the second significance. Third significance is, is it was America's idea, supported by you know Britain, France, and the others, that uh, that future uh, world economic cooperation be given uh, a framework. It shouldn't just be, you know, heads of state meeting each other. There must be some, we must have institutions that, uh, that you know, we will give, lay guidelines for these institutions, but then, and we'll fund them, but then they have to be permanent. They have to have their own executive. They have to have, have their own uh, policies, <laughs> their own <clears throat> strategies. And so out of that came, the Bretton Woods institutions that I'll talk about in a second, you know, the three, IMF, World Bank, and GATT, now NATO, I mean, now WTO. Out of that came, uh, at the same time, America supported Europe in different ways, besides through these institutions. Uh, Marshall Plan, Europe, uh, America put in about, remember the last time, after the First World War, America said, we want our money, $9 billion, $10 billion. This time, they forgave whatever Europe had borrowed in the Second World War, number one. Number two, besides that, they gave about $14 billion of aid then, which I don't know how much that is now, you know, equal to a trillion dollars or whatever. They gave them $14 billion of assistance under this thing called Marshall Plan, and we'll just talk about that in a second. They also created neighborhood between the Allies after the Second World War was that Germany and Japan will never have militaries in the future. That was the decision at the time, whether they do or they don't. They've got some kind of military now, but they're not military powers. Uh, they're not going to have militaries. So America said, we'll take over the defense of Germany against Russia. Remember, Eastern Europe came up to the border of Germany, and Eastern Europe was entirely in the Russian sphere. Of it wasn't just in the Russian sphere. It was actually for all intents and purposes, it was totally aligned with Russia, and the Russian army was present. So, so Germany became the border with Russia, and the Americans then spent a lot of money on defense in Germany, ostensibly against Russia, well, in fact, against Russia. Also, I think to keep an eye and make sure Germany didn't rearm. Remember, the Russians had also taken part of Germany. They occupied East Germany, Eastern Germany. The Allies had also occupied Germany. Britain, France, and America had also occupied West Germany. They all withdrew, but Russia didn't withdraw, as I said earlier. And, and the Allies didn't insist they withdraw. So this NATO was the American army in Europe, uh, plus all European countries contributed to NATO's fund with money. Uh, and they were all meant to contribute a certain percentage of GDP. None of them have done it. You know, consistently, the only country that has done is America. That's why you might have seen Trump complaining about uh, others not funding NATO and Trump saying, what the hell? This is President Trump of America now. What the hell? You know, why should America go on bankrolling NATO? He was muttering a lot about that. But, you know, the NATO cost the Americans 1% of their GDP. And the good thing for Europe was that Europe really did, could, needed, needed not to spend much of its defense because the Americans via NATO were all over Europe. Uh, you know, with the with the 
military troops and uh, uh, you know, air force and uh, bases uh, up and down Europe and you know places where they had aircraft carriers. Anyway, so this reduced the need. All right, should we break now for fifteen minutes? Of oh, this four, three forty-seven. Should we meet again at four? Whoever's awake. So, so Thanks, we meet. Thank you. Thank you. This is obviously, as you know, I mean, this is obviously because of the immense damage in, in, in Europe. Uh, Japan wiped out, Germany wiped out, Britain, uh, quite a lot of Britain bombed, nothing like nothing like Germany and Japan. I mean, not even 10% of it. Um, so America has domination. And uh, in the course of the Second World War, there was a lot of technology advance in military research, which after this after the war was then handed over to the civilians. So the jet engine, radar, computer, antibiotics. Why antibiotics? Because American troops were fighting in Asia, where they were coming across illnesses and bacteria that didn't exist, you know, on the North American mainland or even the European mainland. So big advance in fibers. Uh, the you know uh, synth synthetics existed, but but synth uh, the sophistication in synthetics production uh, flourished during the Second World War. Think of uh, parachutes, for example. You know the very light material, the nylon, but uh, very durable, very strong. So fibers, new kinds of synthetic fibers. The computer. The U.S. Army was really had invented the internet. Their internal communications were in this ring fenced system, internet system that they had devised. Now, slowly all this came out into, uh, in America, a lot of the research for the military is done by civilian corporations, as you know. Their, their planes, etc. you know, the parts of their planes, uh, and then also helping with the design, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of that is handed over to, you know, companies like Northrop, Rockwell, etc. cetera. Uh, so now, now, as this technology became available to the European commercial companies, uh, they were far ahead uh, as, as the Second World War ended. The, um, was, you know, in the first few years after the Second World, World War, they were far ahead of Europe uh, and Japan in, in te technological capability. Now, this martial aid, Marshal Aid, as I said, was uh, Marshal was the name of the general who was responsible for the discussions and uh, agreements that led up to $14 billion being given to Europe. Uh, but, you know, obviously, as with anything in foreign policy, Marshal Aid had a lot to do with self-interest. It was to stop the slide of parts of Europe, you know, to the left, uh, in particular, um, you know, any chance, any risk of you know communist parties coming to power through the ballot box, through elections. Uh, so, in, you know, a lot of that of that money. Germany was one of the biggest recipients of Marshall Aid because Germany was where the biggest risk of the left was, and Germany bordered Russia. Um, much of Marshall Aid was tied to buying from the U.S. and Canada. I think the the deal was 
that 80% of that aid, the Marshall aid, had to be spent on importing goods from America and Canada. So in a sense that money was coming, 80% of Marshall aid came back to America. But there's no doubt that the, the Europeans benefited with whatever they imported. They imported what they needed. Um, and, and as a condition, the, the Americans, um, you know, twisted the arms of European countries to open their, their to, 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 to facilitate uh, American investment, American companies, American corporations setting themselves, themselves, up, themselves up, establishing themselves uh, in Europe. Uh, and also to, to uh, opening the economies for investment to come in easily and for profit repatriation to be simplified. Now, so there was aid, but a healthy measure of self-interest. Export of American goods and with American technological leadership, the capacity of American com companies to either export from uh, America into Europe or come and make uh, those goods in, in Europe that the Europeans were not quite uh, at the, uh, did not quite have the technological capability to imitate. So good for America all around. NATO, I've gone into the background. Made it with Western European partners against communist power and influence. Very beneficial to Western Europe, uh, as I said to you. Amount equal to 1% of US GDP was spent on NATO within Europe, benefiting local economies because big amounts of American troops, you know, so that it's like it's a massive tourism. They're paying them there, the Americans are spending there. And of course, to that extent, the Europeans reduced their own, uh, their own, uh, the Europeans didn't have to spend as much on their own defense as they would have done. Uh, U.S. provided about 15 billion. This is the Marshall Plan. This is besides 12 billion provided during the war. Remember, very different from how the Americans behaved after the First World War. They forgave the 12 billion that had gone out during the war to help Europe, and then this Marshall Marshall Plan was really pure aid for uh, European revival, albeit there was an angle of American self-interest but certainly very, very important for Europe at that time. 85% grants, 15% loan to be repaid uh, in local currency. So, so of the $100, 85 grants that were tied to America and, and Canada, 15%, uh, the, the, I mean, let's say, let's say uh, you know, $100 came to Germany, $85 would have to be spent in America and Canada. And for $15, uh, the, the Germans could do anything they wanted with the dollars, but they had to put a counterpart in local currency, the equivalent in local currency. They had to put that into the account of the American embassy. And those funds could be utilized by the American embassy to support American companies that had come into Germany. I don't know if you remember this term, PL480. This was an AIDS program, and Pakistan got a lot of funding under PL 480, nothing to do with the Marshall Plan. Uh, but the Americans would send us wheat. We would pay for that wheat in rupees and put it in the account of the US Embassy. And the US Embassy would then use that money for any American company that needed it. So all the American banks here were sitting on, on that PL 480 money. Same concept. Uh, so we were following, PL 40 followed the same concept of this 15% that was part of Marshall aid. In return, uh, as I said earlier, the Americans asked Europe for market liberalization, i.e. currency convertibility, free trade, limited government intervention, etc. Uh, suited US business interests, as I've said. Second pillar, the Bretton Woods institutions. Intention, how do we ensure <laughs> that the type of problems we faced don't arise again. The most important initiative in this, against this objective, was the, was the, create, the creation of global institutions 
that would help individual countries for infrastructure development, that would help uh, oversee international trade to make sure that countries were not excessively protecting themselves uh, by putting up trade barriers or non-trade barriers. What are non-trade barriers? <coughs> non-trade barriers are uh, you don't raise the duty. Well, let me give you an example. Uh, some years ago, France complained to the WTO that India had asked it to deliver certain chemicals that France was exporting. Not in Bombay at the time, Mumbai now, Bombay at the time, but in Calcutta. Now, if you think of the map of India, you know, goods are coming from France, here's Bombay, but then to go to Calcutta, it's got to come all the way down, go around Sri Lanka and go all the way up again. It ran about, you know, 10 days to the transit time. And, you know, so an X, not just time, but also cost. That's a non-trade. Or, or when we're shipping goods to India, when we're selling goods to India, if we're selling potatoes and they hold the potatoes up for inspection on their side of the border for a week, so that half the potatoes rot, that's a non-trade barrier. So, so, so the, the encourage international trade by creating a, a body, uh, oversight, global oversight body that would ensure that countries that were practicing excessive trade protection or non -trade, uh, putting up non-trade barriers, that such countries were identified and penalized. Uh, and so infrastructure, international trade, and to align monetary policy management and stabilize exchange rates, i.e. create a system that would work like the gold standard without being as rigid as the gold standard and um, have the same institution that is, 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 that is creating this uh, system of um, stabilizing exchange rates, had the same institution <laughs> responsible for helping countries that were in trade difficulties. Remember, the, under the gold standard, the country had to make the balance all the adjustment needed was on the country uh, was left from the country itself. Now the idea was we won't do that. We any country that is in balance of payments problems, we're not going to ask them now to to you know shrink their economy by ten percent and fifteen percent in their wages fall. We we will ask them to change their policies and to move their policies into a more market direction. But we will allow them to devalue, and we will allow and we will give them more than that. We will give them. Uh, some reserves. We'll give them some money to, to make sure their currencies don't erode further. This was the IMF. So for infrastructure development, and then there was GATT. I'll come back to the World Bank and the IMF. This was GATT, which is now WTO. Rounds and rounds of meetings to realign tariff barriers, to not, you know, to run them down to bring down the average global levels of duty production. Um, and it has, by and large, WTO has been quite successful. Yes, it's got its angles. It's weighted in favor of the you know, larger, uh, larger countries. But whatever it is, it's, it, it has done, uh, had quite a lot of impact in ensuring much smoother global trade. It's been successful, by and large. Now, what happened with the gold standard? What are you going to have as the link, the common link between currencies, which used to be gold. This, the gold standard was replaced with, by countries all linking with the dollar and the dollar being linked to gold at $35 an ounce. So after the Second World War, really till about the mid-70s, most countries in the world aligned their exchange rate to the dollar. Those currencies would go up and down with the dollar. Um, there was, for a while, uh, a group of countries that were linked to sterling, as, and these were ex-British colonies, as was as were Pakistan, the subcontinent, India and Pakistan, initially, you know, in for a certain number of years. And then I don't know when, I think by about the 60s, uh, the sterling block had become very narrow. Countries had gone into the dollar block. Now, the dollar was linked to gold. So any country that was linked to the dollar was indirectly linked to gold. 
but people were then happy to trade in dollars because any country had the right to ask its dollars to be converted into gold by America. But America's, at that stage, America's gold reserves was so much larger than America's foreign liabilities that no one doubted America to convert uh, that gold into that convert. No one doubted America's ability to convert any claim for gold by a country uh, into gold through delivery of gold bars. That people didn't bother to ask for gold. You know, people traded dollars in the confidence that you know that, 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 that there is still a very solid link that the dollar has. The you know America is the world's largest economy, the world's largest trading nations nation, and they've got plenty of gold, so no problem. Now, at the time that the Americans agreed to the system, the overseas dollar liabilities of, uh, of America, the gold stock of America was seven times America's overseas liabilities. By the mid-70s, over 1971, this situation had reversed. America's liability, dollar liabilities were now five times America's gold reserve. So America itself, President Nixon, scrapped the link with gold, the dollar link with gold. And all currencies were now freely floating. There was no link, no formal link with the dollar. Some countries chose to track the dollar, as we do now, as the, uh, as the OPEC countries do. Uh, they track the dollar very closely. You can say they're tied to the dollar, but there is no uh, rigid agreement. Uh, you know, countries are free to change their parity whenever they want to. Uh, how did these American liabilities abroad arise? Can anyone... How did America end up having so many liabilities in dollars? In other words, how did the rest of the world outside America come to own uh, dollars that was set, that had become five times America's gold reserve. Why was there, how was there such a vast amount of uh, dollar volume controlled by non-Americans? Any ideas? Because all the trades and exchanges were happening in dollars now? That's right, because America ran massive deficits. Um, and America did not insist that, that the dollars be repatriated to America. Well, let me explain. The euro dollar market starts in the 1960s. What is the euro dollar market? The euro dollar market is offshore dollars. What the Americans allowed was that any anyone who has dollars also, I'm an exporter from Britain and I've earned a million, I've exported a million dollars of goods to America. If America, if the dollar was not an offshore currency, then I could only hold those dollars in an account in America. That is the case with the Chinese RMB today. It's not an offshore currency. If you have, if you export to China, you will get their local currency in your account, but, but it's in your account in Beijing or, or somewhere in China. It's with some Chinese bank in China. You cannot, you cannot shift it to a bank in Pakistan. Uh, if you could shift it to a bank in Pakistan, then you can do anything you like with it. You can, you can sell that to friends here, to anyone who needs it here, any other trader. You can, you can use it to settle your purchase from Malaysia, if the Malayans are willing to accept RMB. So that money becomes freely available for you to rest uh, to use uh, in the rest of the world. That's what happens with an offshore currency. If, on the other hand, your account is only, let's go back to the American example, uh, if your account was only in America, then you're subject to American controls. 
then if the Americans say you can't use this money outside America, in other words, if it's not an offshore currency, then you can't. You can only use it to buy things from America. But the Americans slowly allowed people to start holding dollars. It started with the euro dollar. Now, now you have dollars. I mean, everyone has dollar accounts in it. So, so, so what was happening was that the U.S. trade deficits were were being retained by ex first with exporters of goods and services. Then also when Americans come out and spend money in tourism. There's a lot of dollars created outside by, uh, you know, American tourist expenditure, American service expenditure. The Americans allowed people to start accounts in Europe, dollar accounts in Europe. They recognized those dollar accounts in Europe. They allowed the banks that were holding those dollars to have their accounts, their dollars held by a correspondent bank, bank in New York. But to the owner of the dollars in London, in Paris, in Germany, uh, to, to, uh, to them, that money was available to spend anywhere in the world. So, so that is an offshore currency. The fact that you can open a dollar account here, you buy a, a dollar from the money changer, you open a dollar account, you can spend it anywhere. The American government has no problem with you doing that. Uh, that's an offshore currency. You can't do that with the RMB. You cannot buy, uh, you might be able to buy small quantities here and there, but uh, you can't buy any big, the Chinese don't uh, allow uh, offshore Chinese accounts, except under very strict control. Let's leave those for, for a moment. They're under very strict arrangements, under swap arrangements. Let's leave them out. Effectively, you can't go and open an RMB account with a, a bank here. If you do have RMBs, uh, you know, exported things to chi uh, China, earn there, and earn money from Chinese buyers, then that money stays there. And you can only use it there. So the Americans created the uh, allowed the dollar to become an offshore currency. As a result, dollars, uh, because of the American deficit and because of American travel, tourism, other service expenditure, foreigners ended up owning a lot of dollars. Central banks then decided to, instead of using gold as their reserve, they decided to start using the dollar as their reserve because the dollar was the most easily accepted currency in international trade. So central banks started keeping their reserves in dollars. Today, 80% of world trade is dollar invoice. And something like 66% of global central bank reserves are held in dollars. So the dollar is, is really, uh, it's, uh, you know, I mean, the Americans dominate the world through the dollar. That's why their sanctions bite so severely. If we break, if any country breaks American sanctions, uh, you know, they, uh, if a company in a particular country breaks American sanctions, uh, the Americans can freeze the account of, of those companies because, let's take, let's take England. So I am a company that trades with a country that America has sanctions on. So let's say sitting in England, I'm trading with Korea or I'm trading with Iran. I, as a company, my company is called X. And I have my dollar account uh, in NatWest Bank, London. Now, where does NatWest Bank, London, keep its dollars? Naturally, it keeps them in the NatWest branch in New York or with the correspondent bank, with Citibank in New York or JP Morgan Bank in New York. So, if the Americans find out that I, X company from London, have been buying goods from Iran, selling goods to Korea, they will freeze, they will instruct NatWest to freeze my dollar account in London and transfer those dollars to the US government. And NatWest has to comply because the dollars that NatWest keeps are in New York. They're in a correspondent account in New York or with its own branch in New York, but they are in New York. All, all currencies are eventually held by the central bank. It's another matter that the central bank might allow you to trade those currencies abroad, uh, uh, you know, if, if it's an offshore currency. On the other hand, the, the home country's central, the currency's home country's central bank can freeze your account anytime it wants to. 
So NetWest will be told freeze company X's account. If NetWest violates that freeze, the Americans will find the Americans have found companies you might have read about. They find banks billions of dollars for violating sanctions. So first of all, my account X company will be frozen. NetWest will be fine. If NetWest does it again, the Americans can say NetWest close your branch. Or we will not allow any American bank to have an account for NetWest, which would mean NetWest would not be able to offer its clients dollars, dollar accounts. You know, NetWest will have to go out of the dollar business. And that's going to be a huge blow to any international bank. So the Americans can influence the world economy in many ways. They can, you know, this, their sanctions have this enormous effect because of what I've just described to you. Then, what happens to the American currency affects every single central bank in the world. Every single central bank uh, has a balance sheet that's held in its local currency. So, if I'm the Chinese central bank and I have reserves of $2 trillion in America, on my balance sheet as a Chinese central bank, I hold those dollars equivalent in local currency. I hold them in RMB. Naturally, my accounting has to be RMB and the central bank. So, so if I'm holding $2 trillion, I'll convert them um, uh, on, my, on the asset side of my balance sheet. I'll show them in RMB. Now, if the dollar rises, my asset, <coughs> the value of my, my asset, <coughs> dollar asset increases. When the value of my dollar asset increases, I have to balance, to balance my, my books, I have to create an offsetting liability, which means I have to credit the excess. So if a dollar was one RMB, I was holding a hundred dollars, I showed that is hundred RMB. If the dollar has strengthened and has become 110 RMB, I have to increase my asset from 100 to 110. I have to now increase my liability side by 10, which means I've got to print local currency, RMB, and credit some account with my, it depends on who gave me the dollars, uh, probably a bank, credit that bank with $10. Now that means I'm adding to money supply. So, so, therefore, what happens with the dollar affects every single central bank in the world. It affects, obviously, all international trading prices. And, and you know, give, <clears throat> give me one reason. Just think about this for a second. Give me one reason. So, you know, all this is called the inordinate privilege of the dollar. But there is one example of not an inordinate <laughs> inordinate, but a very excessive, exorbitant privilege that the dollar has, that, that America has, that no other currency has. I've given you, told you enough for you to be able to guess what that exorbitant privilege might be. It has to do with how America funds its balance of payments, its current account gap. Any, any thoughts? So they don't have to face this problem that you just explained about uh, any other central bank having to balance out their liabilities because they are already maintaining their books in dollars and they don't have to maintain gold reserves against that anymore. Uh, your st I think you're right, but you haven't said it. You could have said it more clearly. Uh, you're, you're, you're going in the right direction. I wonder if anyone else can guess. No, you're going in the right direction. Any other any other thoughts? What is one privilege the US as a, as as an economy has that no other country in the world has? When it comes to trade, or when it comes to paying for trade, paying for a deficit. All right. If America has a trillion, let's say has a five hundred billion dollar trading gap with China, America will have to transfer five hundred billion dollars to the Bank of China, right? 
right? Yeah. Yes, sir. It, uh, it says, says 36 part participants. It sounds as if there's one or maybe two, but anyway, it'll have to transfer $500 billion to China, won't it? What will China's central bank do with those $500 billion? They keep them in, you? Yeah. They keep them in New York or any bank, any, any yeah, place yeah, in yeah, America. Yeah, absolutely right. They'll buy US government treasury bills. <laughs> Because, as I said to you, two-thirds of central bank reserves around the world, which is about $11 trillion, two-thirds of those are held in dollars. So, if America runs a deficit with the rest of the world of $2 billion, that money comes back. So, America's current account deficit is automatically funded on the capital account. Do you understand? The current account is your trade goods and services. The capital account is the, the movements of investment and the movements of money between two economies, unilateral. Trade is related to goods, goods. And this is, the capital account is related to debt and investment. So whatever the ga gap is on your current account, you make up for it either through foreign investment coming in that wipes out your current account gap, or you go out and borrow. So, so that's so you cover your current account through the movements in your capital account and vice versa. If you have a surplus in your current account, you will be your capital account will show a deficit because you'll move money out to, to somewhere else to balance your accounts. If it's so, so if your money if if on on on, on the capital account, you your it increases because you you. Uh, Americans have paid you your whatever they owed you in deficit. So, so your current account shows a surplus. Now, what you'll do with that money that the that the Americans have paid you, if you put it right back in America, then what comes into the capital account goes out of the capital account, and therefore your balance of payments balances. So, so with America. Whatever it loses on the current account, if it runs a $4 billion deficit, if central banks of the world, where the surplus is gone, that's where the surplus is gone. Uh, you know, they, if they buy American treasury bills, then the, the need for America to fund its current account is automatically offset by inflows on America's capital account. Is that clear? Yes. No, no, please, if it's not clear, I'd like someone to volunteer because it's very important to understand this. It's very, I mean, this is America's biggest power. This is America's biggest power America has over other countries. It dominates uh, this, through this mechanism, um, America has a whip hand over the global economy. You know, through, and this mechanism, the, the fact that uh, America doesn't ever need to borrow. And America can, in theory, it can go on running deficits as long as it likes. Until, until when? Volunteers? Until when? What needs to happen to stop this? The other country doesn't want to buy U.S. Treasury pills. What will it buy then? Bitcoin? Gold? Gold. How much? Global reserves are eleven and a half trillion dollars. Try converting them to gold. Gold price will go through the roof. There's not enough gold. And it's not stable anyway. What do you do with gold if, you know, let's say in record take, we find a million tons of gold. What happens to the international gold price? So gold is not... <clears throat> One of those things, uh, it's fine as a supplementary reserve, but as a main reserve, uh, you know, it doesn't have any reliable, long-term, predictable long-term value. At least with the dollar, you can say what the long-term value will be. You're looking at the American balance of payments, you're looking at the interest rates, you're looking at the American economy, you're looking at the growth rates, and you have a pretty good idea of what the American dollar, not a pretty good idea, but you can guess. 
and most people do, a pretty good idea what dollars will be in a year's time and few years' time. And if you're not sure, you can hedge. You can actually go out and hedge your dollar position forward through a bank or with another counterpart. With gold, you can only do that in small amounts. Uh, there isn't enough gold. So, so what else will you do? What else can you do? You can go into other currencies. You could go into euro. You can go into yen. You can go into sterling. But there isn't enough. Those currencies, when you when when eighty percent of world trade is invoiced in dollars, that means the whole world wants dollars. So why would you hold much more of any other currency? when your need is ultimately going to be in dollars. Now, it can only be challenged if you get a currency that is as deep, a currency that is as deep and, wide, and as widely traded as the dollar is today. For a currency to get as deep and as widely traded, there are two essential preconditions. Number one, that country has to have massive reserves and a massive trading position. There is one country that matches that bill today, that matches that, that requirement, and that's China. China's uh, overall exports and imports are bigger than America's. China's trading with all parts of the world. China's reserves are three and a half trillion dollars. So out of the 11 and a half trillion dollars of, of total reserves, China owns one third. More than one third, just over one third. So, but the second condition that it be free, freely tradable can only come true if the currency is made offshore. Can someone explain to me what an offshore currency is and why a currency has to be made offshore if it's going to play the role of a reserve currency? You had explained it earlier in the class. I did, I did, I did. And I, I, I keep hearing your voice. I am longing to hear another voice. And if people prefer, they can sing the answer. If they have a nice singing voice, I might give them marks for the, for the singing rather than what they say. They're free to sing. But let someone try and answer that. This is the trouble with not being face to face. You really can't, because I can't tell whether you've been looking blank or even if you're there, some people might be waiting to hear the, the recording and might have gone for a stroll. Anyway, that's, that, that's their prerogative, nothing I can do. But I think, inshallah, from next week, it will be face-to-face. -face. That gives you an idea of whether people have paid attention, understood or not. I can't tell at the moment. All right, can I go back to the same person who I just said, I want to hear another voice too? You were, you were explaining yeah. why a country had to be offshore. The currency had to be an offshore currency. First, what is an offshore currency? And second, if, it's, if a country is ever going to become a part of any central bank's global reserves, it has to be an offshore currency. So, offshore currency is one which can be exchanged in, uh, out of the country of its origin. So, you explained that... Uh, yeah, Do I did. With US dollar, we can uh, make a transaction denominated in US dollars in any country of the world because the US government allows it. As opposed to an, uh, a currency which is not offshore, you gave an example of China, which uh, allows you to use its currency only in China uh, for transactions. Or if you have uh, earned your uh, uh, Chinese currency, you have to keep it in ch with a Chinese bank or your or a local bank's branch in China. So that absolutely. is what it... Absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, that's absolutely right. China also has swap agreements with certain countries, uh, like with Pakistan. I think we've got about 35 billion won of trade, RMB of, of swap. So, so these swap lines can also be used. But let's ignore the swap lines because they're only available to central banks. Uh, so essentially, uh, you know, I, if I'm a trader, I don't want to hold RMB. 
because I don't know who I might want to buy from. I may want to buy from anywhere in the world. I don't want to be restricted. So, so I, I want my account here in Karachi and I want to be able to pay an Australian and RMB. Now, if I can't do that, then I will not hold that currency in Karachi. I will ask for that to be converted in dollars. And therefore, what the central, our central bank will end up with is with dollars. That's why 80% of world trade is invoiced in dollars. Now, I've gone off script, you know, but this is an important subject because it's very important to understand, you know, I was talking about 1948 to 1972, and here I am talking about 2021. Uh, but it's an issue today with the world. Uh, people feel they're too bound to the dollar. Uh, countries like China feel that, you know, America has uh, too much of a privilege. Uh, but, you know, unless the Europeans and the Chinese and the Japanese get together uh, and decide that RMB will be uh, become an offshore currency and that they will freely op offer up their currencies uh, to be offshore, all of them. Uh, yen is offshore, and euro is offshore, but, you know, you create a collective pool, uh, then you might start to make some inroads into how central banks hold their reserves in which case, America's deficit will not be automatically funded. America may have to go out and borrow, you know, which will then affect the value of the dollar. Because America will be actually now going out and bringing in debt from abroad. Uh, and so people will be, supply, America will be selling dollars to buy third-party currencies. The dollar will weaken. But that day hasn't come. It's, uh, it's not uh, relevant for today, but just bear that in mind. All right, let me go on with. So remember, pillar one was American influence. Now, pillar two, I just told you the outlines of what the Bretton Woods institutions were created to do. So to deal with infrastructure, to deal with trade, and to deal with uh, um, monetary st exchange rate stability and international settlement as, uh, in an orderly way, uh, you know, Originally, the dollar was meant to be, you move to the to a gold-based dollar, but that was scrapped. So today, currencies are freely floating, but this was the arrangement put in place in, in 46, which lasted till the mid as until the early 70s. Uh, now, the IMF role, one second. All right, maybe, maybe for our purposes, uh, let's understand what the IMF does, why it was created. The IMF was created, remember, I told you the three things, infrastructure, ex uh, international monetary and exchange rate stability, and the third was trade. Trade is GATT, WTO. Uh, let's leave that aside. Let's look at the IMF because we've talked about it. Let's talk about the IMF and the World Bank. The IMF was the institution created to ensure stability in international exchange rates uh, through coordination in monetary policies of IMF members. Now, the IMF would also step out and provide funds to countries that were having problems in balance of payments, that were running deficits. But in return for providing them financing, the countries went to sign up to very strict structural adjustment programs. Now, this is what we, every Pakistani should know what structural adjustment programs are, because since 1989, this is the 14th, this one now, that's in place now. It's suspended for the more time being because of COVID, but we're going to sign up again uh, next month in March. Uh, we're, we're going to go back into the program. This is our 14th program. So what the IMF, so you... Uh, so what happens with Pakistan? Let's just take that as an example. We don't seem to be able to sustain growths of more than five and five and a half percent for more than two years or years. We can't sustain them because we don't manufacture enough. So if we have growth, the the demand, if our GNP grows, our incomes grow. If our incomes grow, our demand grows. If our demand grows, it looks for goods. And if you're not manufacturing enough, because you haven't invested enough, then that excess demand 
will go into imports. As it goes into imports, the central bank reserves will fall because you're running now running a current account deficit. The central bank now when the central bank reserves fall, the rupee comes under pressure, starts devaluing. You run the people then start moving out of local currency into dollars because they think the rupee is now going to be further, further and further. You get leads and lags by exporters. I would like to ask you if you know what leads and lags are, but uh, in the interest of time, I won't. Leads means if, if you are an exporter and you think the rupee is going to weaken, because you can see our reserves are coming down, you can see our current account gap is growing. So, so you think now the rupee is going to weaken. If you're an exporter, you will postpone the receipt of those dollars. You want to wait till the rupee is weaker. Naturally, if you foresee a 10% devaluation before year end, you will ask your buyer, look, please hold the money. Hold my million dollars. Send. Uh, I'll tell you when to send them. Now, you might have a problem with your bank because you told the bank the money would be remitted by a certain date, but then you, know, you can just say there are delays at the other end. I, I'm, the money will be coming in a month. But if you haven't borrowed against that money, then you may not have much of a problem anyway. So, so you'll tell your you'll, you'll tell your buyer, don't send it. So these are lags, lags of foreign currency receipt because exporters are postponing receipt. What will importers do if they expect devaluation? They will import more before the price goes up. They'll They'll import more and they will pay all their outstanding. They, if, even if they're getting 90 day payment terms from their buyer, from their seller, they bought something and the seller said, You can pay us in 90 days. Even then, they choose to pay immediately, right? They, so they, they want to get, they, they want, they either, they'll import more and they'll want to make payment immediately. Before the dollar, before the rupee devalues, before the rupee weakens. So these are called leads. So leads and lags are what uh, businessmen start, traders start, people who are involved with trade start doing when they see a currency under pressure. They they lead their import payments. In other words, they rush through with them and they lag their export receipts. They postpone their export receipts. That puts further pressure on the balance of payments. Because money is going, money is going out faster than it's coming in. Hmm. Uh, so, so, so suddenly now, uh, the central bank has a major problem. It tells the finance ministry, "Listen, I'm going, I'm going to have to, you know, if we don't do something about this, there's a serious risk that our reserves get so low that we may be unable <clears throat> to repay our debt, or we may be unable." to honor a letter of credit. So, you know, please do something. In the gold standard days, it would mean interest rates going sky high. It would mean the government, government taxes going sky high, government expenditure going to zero. Very painful adjustment. But with the IMF, with the IMF, unlike the gold standard days, what the IMF will do is, all right, you've got a problem. We'll Let's sign a program. We will lend you $6 billion uh, over a period of time, of which we'll give you $500 million right up front, right now, with which to uh, support your reserves. <clears throat> and the rest we'll give you over two years. But let's agree on what you have to do in your turn, because you've got a problem. And what is your problem? Your problem is your damn trade deficit. Why? Why are you importing so much? So the first thing you have to do is reduce the demand for your reduce the demand in your economy. How do you do that? You raise interest rates. The second, you've got to cut your budget deficit because the government is putting net money into the economy. By if government expenditure exceeds government revenue, net government is adding money to the economy. That money turns into demand, and that also then turns into demand for imports. So you've got to cut your deficit. You, you've got to cut your deficit back as much as you can. Uh, number three, uh, you government are paying too many subsidies. Too many subsidies. You're paying 
your circular debt, which is 2.4 trillion as a total today, is, is, is a subsidy because you have, for every dollar of oil that you've uh, put, every dollar of energy that you put into your pipelines, you only get 70 cents back, which is a fact. We lose 20% in transmission and distribution and about 10% in non-payment. Uh, and the government picks up this cost. So the IMF will say, this is nonsense. Uh, 2.4 trillion is your stock of uh, circular debt and you're losing a billion rupees a day, which is a fact. About a billion rupees a day, you're losing in power. Now, do improve your efficiency. Privatize your distribution companies. Uh, and if, but that will take you time, assuming you agree to do it. Therefore, increase your electricity prices. You can't go on running such a big hole in your budget. Uh, you've got to do something about it. That's why you're seeing now fuel prices go up. You'll see energy prices going up. You know, some announcements have been made. More announcements will be made. As we go back into this IMA program in March, we will have to make good our promise to what we've said we'll do is we'll reduce the... There's nothing we can do about the circular debt. We'll have to pay that through the budget over a period of time. But we have to stop running the leak that we've got, which is about 30%. About 30% of everything, we, of a dollar we put in, we get back actually 72 cents. 28 cents is what we lose. About 19% or 18% to transmission and distribution, and about 9% or 10% through non-payment. And that includes khachas, and it includes kundas, it includes all the other stuff that goes on. So, so the very simple thing is put your prices up by 30%. And uh, you know you you'll stop this loss, which is hitting your budget. Now now we can't put it up at thirty percent, but we have to do a combination of both: improve our efficiency, collect more, uh, lose less in transmission and distribution, and raise prices. We have to do both. <clears throat> so so this is the so 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 when the IMF says here's six billion dollars, five hundred million dollars up front, the rest of the five and a half billion we'll give to you over a. We'll give to you in quarterly installments over, let's say, six quarters, which means the next year and a half. But to be eligible to, for each quarterly disbursement, uh, here's a list of things we've asked you to do. I've just mentioned three things. There'll be 10 things. They'll be privatizing PSEs, public sector enterprises. And that would be one goal. One way the government will show that is going to plug the gap in his budget through privatization because money comes into the government account. That's 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 uh, that's one goal. Uh, it will also be central bank independence. Then the goals are not just quantitative; they're also qualitative. Central bank independence don't interfere with the central bank's ability to set interest rates. Uh, don't make the central bank support the exchange rate. Let the exchange rate be a proper market rate. We don't want the central bank going out and buying. Uh, selling dollars because 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 the dollar is becoming weak. You should leave it to market forces. The central bank must not have to intervene to uh, defend the exchange rate. And the central bank must be absolutely free to raise interest rates whenever it wants to. Let the monetary policy committee of the state bank become the determinant of interest rates, not the finance minister. Uh, so there, there'll be a list of things. There'll be maybe 30 actions and they come under different headings, which maybe when you come to Pakistan, we can, I can describe those headings to you. Uh, they, they come under a different, uh, you know, so, so let's say 30 things we're going to do. Uh, and, and, and we've said of these 30 things, we'll do so many at the end of the first quarter, then, the, then second, third, fourth, and by the sixth quarter, we'll have done, done the board. Now, the IMF would review us quarter by quarter, if we've met our goals, we'll get the second installment, third installment, fourth installment. If we don't meet our goals, there are two choices. Either we negotiate with the IMF some leeway, give us a bit more time for this goal, uh, or we get them to agree that, listen, this goal is not really necessary and these are the reasons, and we make them accept it. Or the IMF, to put it crudely, kick us out of the program. 
The IMF said, we are not really making an effort. Now we're not going to give you any more money. No more disbursements for you. And please give us back uh, what we've given you. We'll give you a year to pay it back. Because, because you're out of the program. In the 14 programs Pakistan's been in, uh, about 10 have, have broken down uh, in the first few stages. In other words, the programs have not been completed and the IMF has refused to disperse anymore. Now, the last, the last program we were in uh, under the PMLN government, we did meet, uh, we did complete the program, but the IMF had to give us, uh, there were 11 points on <coughs> what they, uh, 11 points on which they gave us waivers. W-A-I-V-E-R. Waivers means the IMF either postponed the action which we weren't able to meet or removed the need for that action. So waiver means that you have defaulted We'll either give you more time or forget this point. We won't make it part of the program. We've got 11 waivers. That's a, that's, that's a terrible way to complete a program. You're really sort of completing it, you know, limping and, and badly hurt. All that means is you've completed the program, but you immediately fall back into problems, which is what happened. The PLM, PMLN government left, and immediately as it left, we had to go into another IMF. Now, if we had completed a program successfully and we had sorted out all the, the issues that the IMF had asked us to address, you know, and against the achievement of those issues, the targets, the individual actions, uh, the IMF had given us money, presumably we were now, we were now healthy. But were we healthy? As soon as the program finishes, within a couple of months, we're back to the IMF. Now, I won't go into detail on wrong, but there were two absurd things. Uh, you know, that that uh, any economist will tell you. First of all, the rupee was too strong at 106. That's why soon after the PMLN went, we had 168 from 106. So the rupee was too strong at 106. And we, and we defended that rupee by borrowing dollars uh, from the commercial markets abroad and then using those dollars to, to, to maintain the parity of the rupee. Use, selling those dollars into the market so borrowing and selling the dollars, the rupee stays stable, but your debt climbs. Uh, that was one very big mistake. The second very big mistake was keeping interest rates very low, 6%. You remember then interest rates had to go up to 13%. But keeping interest rates very low at 6%, now, now this kind of exchange rate management is a bonus for whom? For what segment of your business community inside Pakistan? This, this very overvalued rupee, in other words, cheap dollar, that's another way of looking at it, uh, cheap dollar and uh, very low interest rates, so it's easy to borrow. Now, who does this suit most so in this country? For importers? Importers. Yeah, absolutely right. Importers and traders. This is a policy made for them. And who does it hurt most? Local manufacturers. Domestic manufacturers. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Because if the rupee should have been 168, which is what it became a few months later. And it's 106. You as a manufacturer are getting killed by imports that are coming in at an artificially low price and competing with you in the Pakistani market. So what is the government of Pakistan actually doing through maintaining such an overvalued rupee and making borrowing so cheap? What is it actually doing? Isn't it actually subsidizing foreign exporters to Pakistan? It amounts to? Yes. Yes, it is. Sir. So, so you, as a Pakistani consumer and taxpayer, it's a transfer from your pocket and a transfer from the pocket of our manufacturers to the pocket of our traders. Anyway, that's an aside. 
we'll come back to Pakistan when we discuss Pakistan. But uh, so the IMF role, I've explained to you, the IMF role is a country that balances payments difficulties. We will, unlike those standards, but you weren't allowed to devalue. We'll allow you to devalue. We will give you money to protect your immediate outflow of reserves. But you've got a problem, which is why you've got this deficit. And you have to address that problem. And here, you draw up your action plan about how you're going to address it. We will take a look at it. We'll make our comments. Then we'll reach an agreement. You implement that agreement. We will disburse money to you in tranches every quarter uh, as you implement that program. If you don't implement it, we finish. No more disbursement. If you implement it, by the end of the program, you should be in good health. Now, if we've been to the IMF 14 times since 89, 31 years, we spend more of our life under IMF programs than out of IMF. And if we still have this tendency to you know, go back into the need for a program, what would you say if you were a doctor and you were treating your, your IMF, you're the doctor, and you're treating the patient, Pakistan, who's come back to you with the same problem uh, 14 times, what did you tell him? You're not serious about your disease. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. You know, the IMF doesn't have the luxury, uh, but it doesn't have the luxury of saying that. But it would say something like, you know, if you really want to hit the hard drugs that you hit, and if you're going to go on doing that, then, you know, don't keep coming back to me. If you're not serious, don't come back. Um, and, and, you know, it's a fact. Why is it like this? What else can be different? I mean, this government's made taken some very some very good initiatives, but you know, a lot more need to be taken, and we'll discuss those when it comes. But you see the difference between the IMF adjustment and the gold standard adjustment. The IMF gives you support, which the gold standard didn't give you. But and it demands less severe adjustment uh then the gold standard would have uh, demanded because the gold standard would not have you know, allowed you to divide it not have given you any front end money or any money uh, over time at all all that you would have to create out of the sheer compression of your economy and maybe that's what uh, really is a better program for us let's not go to the imf let's shrink as much as we can it'll cause chaos but maybe that's the only medicine we can take we can understand um that's not quite true. I said that cynically. We can improve. There's a lot of potential. But you know, Disraeli, the British Prime Minister, said of Argentina at the end of the 19th century, the Argentine is a country that has a lot of potential and always will have. Meaning it will never actually realize that potential. Always will have. Uh, in our case, I inshallah we will and we'll talk about that when we come to Pakistan. Now, so that's roughly how the IMF works. The IMF was originally envisaged gains. When, when they sat down to discuss the IMF at Bretton Woods, just after the Second World War, Keynes represented the British delegation. And he had his own proposal for what the IMF should be. Uh, the Americans, there's a man called White. I'm forgetting his first name. Uh, the Americans came up with the IMF. This this IMF that we have, Keynes had a different version for how, how it would work and what it would be. <coughs> what one was America. And, uh, and, and, and you'll see why America argued for the IMF to be what it is in a minute. And it's linked to this exorbitant privilege of America that I was talking about. Keynes said, let's not have the IMF. Let's have an international clearing bank with certain other powers. So, like the stock exchange, this central bank will be the clearing bank for all the world's trade. All the world's trade will flow through the central bank. And therefore, at the end of a period, at the end of, a, of the year, this central bank will have accounts of who owes what to whom. And then the central bank, this international central bank, uh, can decide what it wants to do about countries that are too much in deficit or too much in surplus. Um, it can help finance those countries that are in deficit within limits. 
and it can ask surplus countries that you know it can penalize them as well. Why not penalize if this duty of adjustment is global? And remember, if there are just two countries in the world, block A and block B, just two countries, A and B, and if A has a huge surplus, that means it's taken resources out of B. B can't grow because <clears throat> it has to keep transferring its surplus, its earnings to A for the deficit that it ran with. Is that good for A? What damage is that doing A? There's two countries in the world. One country has a huge surplus. The other country has a huge deficit. Is that good for... What is the damage that is doing the country with the huge surplus? So the country B won't have... Um, there won't be much demand for products from... That's right. Country. That's right. You. That's right. You will just shrink your market. So your producers, where will they sell now? If we can't buy. So Keynes made this very valid observation. He said, let's not penalize only the deficit country. Let's also penalize the surplus country. Now, does the, so, so what, how do you penalize the surplus country? Will you tell the surplus country that what you're doing is detrimental to the interests of the whole world? You should revalue your currency by 30%. That will make your goods more expensive abroad and goods of other countries cheaper for you. World growth will be better. So that's one way they can penalize. They can penalize them through a fine. Now, this was Keynes's vision uh, to have a central clearing bank that would penalize both deficit countries and surplus countries. Most importantly, the you could countries could borrow from this central bank, uh, and they could borrow in a currency issued by the central bank. It would not be dollars. The central bank would create a currency. I'll just explain Keynes's proposal to you. The central bank will will print its own, make create its own currency. And that that becomes the dealing currency of the world. Now, you can imagine that if that scheme had gone ahead, then world trade would more and more and more and more be invoiced in that currency, because that is the currency of the trading house. The currency created by the International Clearing Bank would be the currency people traded in. What would happen to the dollar then? You know, the dollar would not have this exorbitant privilege. That's why in this... Uh, discussion with Keynes, the American delegation, uh, my memory is going to hell, I'm forgetting the name of the, he, he was a very important American uh, uh, political economist. Um, anyway, his argument was nonsense. We are going to have, I've explained the IMF, that's what we're going to have. And the IMF is going to have a currency, but it's only going to be a currency for recording purposes. It is not going to be a currency for trading purposes. So so we are going to, so the IMF's currency is going to be the special drawing rights, SDRs. And the SDRs will be a basket of currencies. It's going to be, the SDR will be a basket of currencies. Now, in those days, I've got the, uh, this is my the wrong presentation. I've got the breakdown of the SDR. When they set the SDR up, it was about 42% dollar. It was a basket of currencies. Five major currencies of the world uh, were put together to create the SDR index. 42% dollar. I think it was about 12, 14, 15% Deutsche Mark. Uh, then, or maybe sterling was bigger, 15, 16%, and then yen, and then the French. Can someone just quickly look up the composition of the SDR now? It's changed. It's changed. The dollar, the dollar has, it's changed. There's a sixth currency. 
in the SDR now. So if it was dollar, yen, sterling, French franc, Deutsche Mark, that's five. Forget the fact that two of them have become euro, that's five. Another currency has been added. Can anyone guess what that might be? Come on, wake up. We've been talking about it. Chinese currency? Yeah, RMB, because China is such a big part. Yeah, has someone looked up the composition of the... <coughs> Sir, Chinese yen, euro, Japanese yen, UK pound and US dollar. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, you're right. What's the composition? What is the US dollar? How much? What percent? 15... Uh, the US dollar is 41.73 percent. Euro is 10.93. Okay. Chinese yuan is 10.92. Japanese yen is 8.33. And pound sterling is 8.09. All right. So now if you if you look at the original composition, uh, the RMB wasn't there. And both sterling and yen had much bigger shares. So once the RMB came into the SDR, and it had to, because what was this basket meant to represent? This basket was meant to rep represent the most commonly traded international currencies or, 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 or the most commonly invoiced currencies for trade. So the Americans could have made the whole... Anyway, so, so that, that, that's what it was meant to represent. So once the uh, China became very big, it had to be included. And as it was included, everyone's share was cut. The biggest cut uh, in, in was uh, uh, Great Britain. But remember, remember, this is not a trading currency. The IMF does not, when the IMF lends you one SDR, it's actually lending you those currencies. So you can't trade the SDR. The SDR is simply an accounting mechanism the IMF keeps. So if we get one SDR, what we get is what you mentioned, 42% in dollars, we'll get 42 cents of dollars, 32 cents of euro, etc., etc., etc. And, and, and then that's the assistance they've given us. And then we, we can use those as we like, or we can convert them into dollars and use them as we like. When we repay, we'll have to repay in those same units again. But what we cannot do is start trading SDRs. It's not a currency. Do you understand? We will still trade in dollars. So, so, so the SDR is simply an internal accounting mechanism. It is not a tradable currency. Is that understood? It's important to understand that because what Keynes had suggested, uh, the, cent the international clearinghouse would have created a currency and then, then the dollar may not have been, the, may not have had this exorbitant privilege that it has now. Um, the, uh, now, America has complete control on the IMF. Each country contributes to the IMF and the contribution is called its quota. I'm sorry, this is the wrong slide. I've got details on the IMF in another slide, but let's leave that aside now in the interest of time. Each country contributes a certain percentage of its GDP. That becomes its quota in the IMF. Now, all that money is actually paid in. I think you paid you paid 25% in dollars and 75% in your own currency, something like that. Um, anyway, those are the reserves the IMF has. And those reserves today are about $200 billion. But the IMF can also borrow about $250 billion. The IMF can also borrow. So the total, uh, they also have, uh, they're authorized to issue uh, bonds. And it can borrow via that mechanism. So the IMF can, uh, in total controls about $900 50 billion dollars of resources that it can give to countries that are, that are facing balance of payments difficulties. Who controls the IMF? Well, you have a vote in the IMF equal to your quota. American economy was so big that in the beginning, America held 33% of the IMF voting quota. Now, in IMF, in the IMF, the requirement for a change in any basic clause of the IMF. And a basic clause would be something like, let the IMF issue currency of its own. 
let it create a currency of its own. Uh, any basic change like that needs needs a super majority. Super majority is 85% of the votes cast. America, the American vote has come down from 33% to 17% because other countries have got richer. So their quota, relatively richer. I mean, America is still the world's biggest economy, but other countries you know, have also grown in size. And the rest of the world has grown proportionately more than America has because of the fast growth in countries like China. So, so America's uh, block now, you know, since, since it's a percentage of GDP that every country uh, donates or pays, America's vote now has come down to 17%. But because of this 85% super majority clause uh, that is needed, 85% of the vote, you can't make any fundamental change. America can block it, just America by itself. And by the way, it'll never be just America by itself blocking it. If it comes to blocking it, there'll be a lot of countries that will stand alongside. I mean, there's a whole group of countries that America can pressure. All right, there's enough of the IMF. Can I just look? It's 5.16. Is it all right if we finish at half past five? Hello? OK, sir. Yes, sir, that's OK. All right, I'm sorry to have, I'm sorry if I've woken anyone up. But OK, we'll finish in 15 minutes. Uh, I won't be able to uh, finish this lecture. We've discussed a lot of things that are uh, tangential, you know, to the main subject, but uh, they're useful and they are th subjects, topics that will arise uh, again and again. Just read through this quickly, and I'll, I'll go, I'll go through through it. All right, so I think that's fairly clear what Keynes had intended. And it's not a bad idea. And let's take two countries. Let's take Japan and Indonesia. Japan's running a, running a huge surplus with Indonesia. I told you, if there was pressure on Japan, if we had the international clearinghouse mechanism, if there was pressure on Japan, do something about it. What Japan might do is say, all right, our biggest surplus with Indonesia is because of the number of cars, Toyota and Honda and, uh, and Mazda and all our companies sell to Indonesia. So why, Japanese companies might say, why don't we make those cars in Indonesia? We, as companies, will earn a higher profit because Indonesian costs are lower. Our exports from Indonesia of those cars, besides what we sell locally, um, will be cheaper. We'll capture more export market from Indonesia. It'll show up as Indonesian trading surplus. And we will make money. We'll make our profit like we do in Japan. In fact, we might make a slightly bigger profit. So what may have happened under this mechanism is that you would have got what has happened now, globalization. Now people are locating abroad to find the best combination of cost and skills. They're not all manufacturing within America or Japan, you know, the global supply chains. But it's happened now in the last 10 years. Had Keynes' uh, uh, plan, the International Clearinghouse, been put into operation, uh, the same thing, this global investment, the globalization might have started a long time earlier, all to the benefit of developing countries. But anyway, you know, China, countries like China um, are uh, really asking for a reform of the IMF, in particular, because they want to try and break this stranglehold that the dollar has 
on the global economy for reasons I've discussed. So this is still the second pillar. The next thing is the World Bank. Now the World Bank was a burning need at the time for, for all countries, Western Europe and America and Japan, because the amount, because of the amount, remember this, in, the World Bank was meant to be, it was meant to finance post-war reconstruction and long-term infrastructural needs of countries. The big need after the Second World War was post-war reconstruction. Now, why, why, why were the Americans so keen to see post-war uh, post reconstruction? Because, because the American corporate sector was right on top of the world. Uh, and if Europe and Japan started their own economic recovery and started putting their surplus money into infrastructure instead of buying goods, uh, that would have not suited American companies because American companies had a lot to sell. You know, their, their manufacturing had not been impacted. So it suited everybody. I'm not saying that the World Bank was because America wanted its, its companies to sell more. Um, you know, that was a side effect. But basically, the idea was to have uh, uh, the World Bank initially assist with European reconstruction. And, and, and the reason, the important reason was that if countries could borrow for their infrastructure, then they could use their own money for their domestic companies, for their domestic manufacturing, for their domestic initiatives. We should create domestic employment, create demand, therefore more uh, production, therefore more need for labor, therefore more growth. Countries will recover quite fast, and the infrastructure needs, which would be because they've been bombed to bits, the infrastructure needs they they could pay for over a long period of time through long-term loans from the World Bank. Uh, subsequently, the World Bank was enlarged to include the IFC, which is the part of the World Bank that finances private corporations, and the International Development Agency, which finances the lowest-income countries at below $1,000 per capita at very low interest rates. Later, Asian Development Bank, Latin American Development Bank were created with the same focus. <coughs> now, I don't think I'll be able to finish this today, but let me see. I did want to start China next time. But let's see how much we can do in the next eight minutes. I will try and not move into the side alleys and To get the first two points, the, the, it's simply to say that Europe in the 1960s was at a level, level of GDP and income that was just not invisible. invisible. So in, uh, now, because that level of GDP and that level of private income had been created over the course of the century, in spite of the Great Depression, and in spite of two world wars, both of which destroyed a lot of capital and a lot of businesses, in spite of all that destruction, um, you know, European countries ended up far ahead of where they would have been had the two world wars not happened and had the depression not happened. That's what that second paragraph said. I won't go into detail on that. So what was the principal forces? What are the principal forces behind this escalation in growth? <coughs> this is the third pillar, the mixed economy. I'm saying that the mixed economy worked very well to create this growth. What sustained the years of high growth, high employment, high demand without overheating? I was telling you Pakistan grow, can't grow more than 5, 5.5% five without overheating. How were these countries able to sustain it year after year after year? Then Pakistan, uh, you know, they were already, already advanced countries. How would they be able to sustain it for a solid 20, 25 years? And then what happened? If everything was going so well, how did this all crumble? Three factors primarily responsible. Now let's look at Europe. America, we know why America grew, or, or broadly, we know why America's leaked where America's lead came from, and we understand America's strength, both in global trade, in domination of um, uh, glo uh, global currency through its exorbitant privilege, and of course, uh, the fact that at least for the first two decades after the World War, its companies were far ahead in technology. Then Europe started catching up. Anyway. So let's look at Europe. 
uh, three reasons for Europe to have grown very fast. The first was the Europeans decided, you know, we've, this is 1946, they, they looked back to 1914. They said in the last 32 years, no neighbors have done to each other throughout history. No neighbors have damaged each other so much in the, in the last 32 years uh, ever in history. There's something wrong with us. If we've spent you know, 50 million killed in the Second World War, well, you know, Russia include Japan as well, so it wasn't only a European war, but a lot of Europeans killed. First World War, 10 million killed all Europeans. It was really 95% Europeans. It was really, you know, so so is, is that, what do we do? What's wrong with us? Uh, you know, are we sort of wild dogs? Whenever we catch sight of each other, we eat each other up. But but we can't be. We also, the, you know, the <clears throat> most advanced culture, we also colonial master, we master of the universe, we created Beethoven, Schiller, Einstein, and we're geniuses. But, but what's wrong with us? You know, Periodically, we turn into <coughs> Frankensteins, into maniacs, into monsters, into cannibals. There's only one way we can ensure that this will not happen again. And that is if we integrate our economies in such a way that in future, no one can be better off by hurting anyone else because we've all become so in interdependent. We should create an economy within Europe where goods are made according to comparative advantage, freely traded, labor is able to move from anywhere to anywhere. In the fullness of time, we'll move to a, a single currency. <coughs> but let's, uh, let's go in that direction. Let's begin integration. Um, and that will be our insulation, our insurance, our protection against future wars. So that's what they did. I've got a separate presentation on the EEC, so I won't go into it now. Started with six countries, now it's 29 countries. And uh, it's been steadily progressive. It started with, first with steel. Steel became the common market item. Then all agricultural goods were added. Gradually, all goods were added. Then movement of people was added. Movement of services was added. And eventually, a single currency. As a result, you know, just in the, in the 15 years, after the Second World War, uh, trade openness, which is uh, trade openness is a ratio, it's your exports plus imports as a percentage of GDP. In Pakistan's case, exports of about 22, imports of about 43, that's $63 billion, the 60, 60, 42 plus 23, 65 billion dollars, GDP of 240, so that comes to about, about 22, 23% trade openness. So that was the that was the European average trade openness uh, <clears throat> in 1920. Uh, sorry, in 1945, that's what it had been historically. Uh, just in 15 years, that grew to 55 percent, and that was the cross European trade I was talking about. Primarily, they were also trading with the rest of the world, with America, of course, but uh, primarily this growth was because of inter-European trade. They they did achieve. Uh, that interdependency that they had set out. The second reason for this very fast growth was improved technology. I told you American technology came into Europe. The American companies led, but European companies caught up. And so, so you can see that, you know, things like there was only Boeing in the 50s, in the early 60s. Well, Boeing started, the jet started in the late 50s, early 60s. Now they then, you know, then came Airbus. The Europeans were the first to introduce electric trains. These fast trains, Americans, America still doesn't have it. Uh, so in many ways, uh, the Europeans set up collaborative research, joint ventures, and uh, a number of uh, disc, uh, in a number of technology where they were backward relative to America. They filled in a lot of those gaps uh, through joint ventures and cooperation, um, and and you know caught up fairly soon caught up with America. Now, you know, why did Europe, how did European currencies continue to strengthen while Europe was growing so fast? 
even while Europe was running trade deficits, in your high growth periods, you may run trade deficits because you're importing capital goods, which you're going to use to manufacture and exports will come later, but first will come the imports. So, so, so how is Europe able to overcome uh, this inevitable period of, of running deficits, it will pass through <clears throat> in the early years before, you know, the, the, the machinery imports and their own uh, technology improvements would put them into a surplus position. Well, initially, Marshall Aid helped. It supplemented their balance of uh, payments position, uh, current account position. Um, but really, the exchange rate stayed stable in spite of deficits because of the sheer rate of growth of Europe. So if you were holding Deutsche Bank and you were British or you were American, uh, Germany may have had a deficit in the early years, but you saw the German rate of growth, you saw the German rate of progress, and you decided you'd hold on to the Deutsche Bank. You wouldn't sell it because Germany in a few years would become an industrial giant, as it did. So so, so the point about the, 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 the high growth, one feature was very much this, that 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 their excellent growth performance persuaded people to not worry about their temporary uh, deficits and their countries and their currency stayed strong. So that in spite of budget deficits and current account deficits, uh, the, the countries did not run into balance of payments problems where they had to go out and borrow. Now, having said that, there were a couple of countries that do, that 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 had to go out and borrow from the IMF. Britain, I think, went to the IMF certainly once, maybe more than once. Uh, but by and large, by and large, that was uh, a minor, uh, a minor irritant or a minor event compared to the major event of sustainable long-term growth. So these are the three factors responsible: free trade, improvement in technology and the high growth rates itself that, that allowed countries to rent, run deficits because people outside, foreigners who are holding their currencies could see these countries are growing in such a way. Doesn't matter about budget deficits if the GDP is growing at 5% and 6%, then in future government tax revenues are going to grow because corporate performance is very strong and therefore government uh, revenues will improve and this deficit will go. Uh, I'm sorry, I said 5.30. I do want to finish this. They, they, they are... Let me finish the... The three pillars. There's just one more slide after this. Then, okay, then, sir. yeah. Then the next time I'll start with, if this is all so good, why did it collapse? Now, so I said three factors which I mentioned, but let's go back to this issue. How did the European economies achieve this high growth, and why was that high growth so? Uh, self-reinforcing so that you, you didn't end up with hiccups and breakdowns and countries, you know, having to run policies of austerity uh, like we keep having to do, austerity coming from having to borrow from abroad and, and, and borrow from the IMF and then being dictated to by the people who are lending to us because the people who are lending to us are concerned that we have to pay back. So they will ask us now to stop spending and start saving. Uh, you, you know, I said Europe by and large didn't have that. What is the reason? Very successful mixed economy. The reasons for that sustainable high growth rate <laughs> is that the government role <laughs> was very strong and very positive. Uh, high welfare expenditure, 16 to 27 percent of GDP. Government owned some uh, uh, a government own utilities, which is, you know, air, road, rail, uh, underground, and some heavy industries. 
aeronautical, specialized steel, chemicals, mining. And I've given you the reasons why government did that. It's because these were basic goods and the government, the private sector, you know, if a private sector industrialist uh, or would be industrialist wanted to make something, he'd like to make cars because he can sell them within a month of finishing them. It could take him a year to set up the plant. By the end of the second year, he's making money. But if he's going to set up a steel mill, it's going to be, to be a steel mill has to be a certain minimum size, uh, 5 million tons, uh, to be, you know, to get the economies of scale. But that's a hell of a lot of money. And it takes two, three years to, um, uh, you know, it takes a year and a half to complete. It takes three years to get the full, the full, and it might be fourth year, fifth year before we break it. So, so industries typically would rather make cars than make steel. So the government said, all right, we'll make steel. We'll make the mines. We will do all the aeronautical engineering. And we will supply them to you, private sector. Uh, at, we want to make enough money to be able to stay in production. We don't want profit. <laughs> so, so you, private sector, will get these goods from us quicker and cheaper than you would if they were being made by the private sector. It made sense. It made sense at the time. Uh, the private sector was very supportive of this and the private sector took full advantage and grew very, very fast. Meaning the private sector outside heavy industry, uh, you know, mechanical industry, machine manufacturing, auto, consumer goods, light consumer goods, and the whole framework. Now, now, Europe did not fiddle with prices. This is very important. Europe did not rig the market with subsidies and support. Uh, resources, uh, resource allocation was left to market prices. Uh, there was no licensing. Uh, there, were no, there was no foreign exchange allocation. We'll only give it to some industries, not to others. Exchange rate was left free. Uh, there was no system of permits. Anyone could come in and make whatever they wanted. So, so both resource allocation and prices were left entirely free you know, to be set by the market. Highly trained and productive labor force. Why? Just think of this. Because you had millions of people coming out of the armed forces. As the armies were disbanded and you know, toughened by the war, energetic, trained, you know, trained by the military, trained as engineers, trained, trained as uh, you know, workers. all different types of manual uh, activity uh, and most of all discipline you know understanding you know the their role uh, in, in in the production processes uh, and not needing to be pushed or or, or, or uh, and really having no great desire to sort of unionize and become a nuisance at that stage so so that was one reason the second reason why there was no problem with uh, uh, labor cost is because Europe opened up people live Pakistanis in England. Two thirds of them are descendants of people who went across from Kashmir, from around Azad Kashmir, around Mirpur, etc., Bradford, Birmingham. They went to Bradford and Birmingham to go and work at the textile mills. So that is mainly northern Punjab and Azad Kashmir. Um, there's three million now, but so so. So Britain opened up to uh, labor from the subcontinent. Germany opened up to labor from Turkey. There are about three and a half million Turks in Germany. And Germany also, also Europe, countries like Yugoslavia, countries like Spain, were not growing the way Northern Europe was growing. So a lot of labor came from Southern Europe to countries like Germany, countries like Austria. France came a lot of North Africans. Algeria had been part of France after the Civil War. Uh, Algeria earned independence, but Algerians came to work in France. Moroccans came to work in France. And Africans from France's African colonies, uh, Ivory Coast, Senegal, Mali, these are French colonies. So, so both, so labor, high quality labor, well trained, and Cost of labor was kept low by constant immigration. If you keep in, increasing the size of the labor pool, you'll keep costs down. The last point is important. 
there was an agreement between state guided they go through state guided negotiations between uh, employers and labor that that inflation adjustment would be made the following year that that whatever the that labor would not demand inflation in the cost of this year so if inflation has been 5% in the course of this year you won't get this 5% increase this year you'll get it in your next year's negotiation this year you'll get whatever you agreed to last year. so so that labor cost stayed predictable uh, now in return for this businessmen were encouraged not to to manage profits within reasonable margins not to go for bust on profit excessively uh, out of reach uh, for positive reasons you know the more affordable you're, what you're making the more of it you can make now the high welfare expenditures led to the growth and the overall economic growth led to a very solid very large middle class um, you know something like 65% of uh, 70% of europe was middle class by the end of the 1970s and 15% you could say Uh, between rising from 20 to 35% of GDP. A lot of American FDI, American investment in Europe, a lot of Japanese investment in Europe. And the internal reconstruction demand, you know, the, from the world, uh, from the, the destroy, destroyed buildings and ports and airports, that also actually helped initially, helped the heavy industry grow very fast, steel, engineering, construct, and construction companies. All right. The, uh, this is this is it. So <clears throat> remember the three pillars: the contribution of each pillar. Uh, you know the first institutions. The third is the mixed economy and how how that balance was managed. No country has is capable of sustained growth rates of over 5% if it has if it has not invested around 25% to gdp if investment has not reached 25% to gdp and sustain that level for a number of years how much is our investment to gdp pakistan yes. around 5 to 10%. No, it's about 15%. India, Bangladesh, 30%. So when we look at Pakistan, bear all these things in mind. You know, we have to catch up. So I'd like to use our session on Pakistan. Not so much to discuss what our problems are, but really, so so keep these things in mind. Keep the low, uh, keep keep also in mind this constant need to go to the island. What is it we do wrong? Bear in mind agriculture. You know, huge part of our economy, but how much do we put into it compared to what we put into industry, which where we really not. You know, uh, we have a globally uncompetitive industry. Anyway, okay. So so this part is finished what remains is what went wrong and we'll discuss that uh, discuss that the next time okay thank you that's it thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.